Okay, morning everybody. Warm welcome to you. This is the sixth year of ANSVAR's Education Forums. Um, some of you have been to all of those, so congratulations. There isn't an extra award there, but you know, may hopefully make you feel good about yourselves. Um, my name's Matt Absalom. I'm the State Manager for Victoria and Tasmania. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, a knowledgeable and varied set of speakers today. Um, just a quick run through the agenda. Um, after a brief introduction from ANSVAR CEO Warren Hutchin, um, we will hear about the huge changes that are already underway in the disability sector and the importance of understanding the implications for your clients and, and no doubt actually personally for many family members and friends that may be affected. Then after a short break, uh, we'll look at the solutions ANSVAR has worked on to address the changes we will have heard about um, and the, particularly in the risk solutions that we can bring to that sector and also the other sectors that ANSVAR operates in. We'll then conclude the day with a short refresher about ANSVAR's product suite before a light lunch is available for those of you that are able to stay and network with the rest of the ANSVAR team. We've got a good turnout from ANSVAR here today, so it's your chance to have a chat to them too. At the end of today and after today, we'll, we'll be arranging for train certificates for three CIP points to be sent to you. Um, if you haven't got a name badge or haven't been able to register at the front, if you can make yourself known to the people up there, we'll make sure that we get your name down for that. Um, so, to start off with, we will, um, I'll just have a brief introduction to Warren. Uh, Warren's been ANSVAR CEO for three years, since May 2014. Um, immediately before that, he was CEO of the VMIA. Um, and in his time at ANSVAR, Warren has really led the charge to make sure that we focus our business on risk solutions and risk management, and, and that really comes to the fore today. So I'm going to pass over to Warren to talk a little bit more about ANSVAR. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Matt, and good morning to everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, I think most people will have a little bit of an understanding of ANSVAR, but we've got a lot of uh, new people in the room as well. So I thought I'd just give a little 10 minute or five to 10 minute overview of ANSVAR and who we are for those that are new to us as an organisation. So ANSVAR has been operating in Australia for over 50 years now. Uh, we're a um, wholly owned um, subsidiary of EIG, uh, which is a UK based uh, insurance group, group, ecclesiastical insurance group. Uh, ecclesiastical is owned by ATL, uh, which is All Churches Trust, which is a charity. So we're a little bit different to many insurance companies in that uh, ultimately ANSVAR is owned by a charity and all of the, the profits that we make and the dividends that we pay ultimately find their way back into the community. So that's uh, where we are is a little bit of a difference. Uh, in terms of EIG, uh, EIG was actually set up in 1887. Uh, predominantly to ensure the Church of England assets and uh, to this day actually still ensures about 97% of the uh, Church of England assets in the UK and Ireland. It's one of the UK's largest corporate donors as you'd expect. It has uh, three uh, business divisions, uh, general insurance is, which is what we do here in Ansvar in Australia. It also has a, a business called Eden Tree which is uh, funds management and Eden Tree for the last seven years in a row has won our uh, best uh, ethical investor in the UK. So we're very proud of that as well. Uh, the group also owns a couple of insurance brokers businesses in the UK. The, the ethical piece though around the, the ownership and the group certainly flow through into ANSVAR's um, overall uh, vision. You can see there that our goal is to be the most trusted and uh, ethical and I'll make the point risk and insurance uh, provided in our core sectors. So there has been a quite a focus over the last few years on ANSVAR's capability to be able to deliver risk solutions because for us it's not just about uh, paying claims, it's about uh, helping our brokers and their end clients around uh, minimising risk and uh, reducing uh, the risk of claims. Uh, who we are? We, uh, we are a specialist uh, risk and insurance provider. We operate in five core sectors. Uh, community for us is a sector that includes things such as not-for-profits and charities, quite a strong focus for us in that area. Secondly, uh, care. Care for ANSVAR is things like aged care, child care, uh, disability care, which is what you're going to hear about today, as well as areas of allied health. Faith, I think we're generally known as being quite strong in the faith sector. Uh, there's Catholic Church Insurance and then outside of that we are probably the leading insurer uh, in terms of faith in Australia and that includes both Christian and non-Christian faith. Uh, for example, uh, we're the largest insurer of Jewish synagogues in Australia. So the faith sector is quite an important area for us. It's about 30% of our business. 
Uh, property owners, this is an area where uh, ANSPAR has launched recently uh, more heavily into the property owners business on the back of um, aligning with our parent. Uh, our parent in the UK, they call it real estate. They have uh, a very, very large property investors real estate division and we're slowly starting to build that, uh, that sector within Australia. And finally, education. So education is a very important area for us as well. It's one of our great opportunities for growth and we'll be focusing very much on that going forward over the next three years as well. Uh, I thought I'd just mention some of our uh, things that we're doing in terms of community and the values within the organisation. Uh, we encourage our staff to get involved and we, we do that through a number of different things, different ways. We also get involved with corporate sp uh, sponsorship and, and uh, etc. Uh, we give staff time off to uh, volunteer and to work with organisations as well and we, uh, we very much encourage that. Um, one thing I did want to call out is our community education uh, program. You can see that we've been involved for a number of years of providing grants uh, into the community uh, and we, um, those grants are really focused around a theme around adults, uh, sorry, uh, youth, youth empowerment. So one of the areas that we, we really think is important in terms of our sectors and in terms of the community within Australia is to support youth. And youth for us is um, anyone that's under the age of 25. Uh, so any organisation that's got a program that supports empowering youth, helping youth develop into leadership capabilities, or even programs where uh, youth are disadvantaged through uh, drug and maybe alcohol addiction, they're the areas that we really want to focus on in terms of, in terms of these uh, community education grants. And there's just a, a number of the um, uh, organisations that received a grant last year. And I will encourage you, if you are, if you are uh, in an organisation that does activities with, um, uh, with youth, have a look at the ANSVAR website to understand the opportunity for applying for some of these grants. So that's, uh, that's ANSVAR. Um, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an overview of who we are and uh, why we do what we do. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Diana Borgmeyer, who's our uh, Head of Risk Solutions. Um, uh, Diane has been with ANSVAR since uh, July uh, 2014 and prior to that was with uh, the VMIA uh, where we both worked together actually for a, for a while. Uh, Diane has uh, been responsible for developing uh, the, the market and leading uh, risk solutions for ANSVAR and our core sectors. Um, she's also been involved in a number of areas in terms of uh, risk consulting services, education, advising public cl uh, sector clients. She uh, has extensive experience in leading enterprise risk management and government functions in both public and private sector organisations, with particular expertise in strategic risk management and the application of risk management in the area of complex social policy risk, which I must say I'm not quite sure what that is, Diana, but I'm, it, sounds, it's, it sounds impressive, so that's all good. Uh, just finally about Diana, she's also on the board of a uh, community health organisation and is the chair of their quality risk uh, and Quality and Risk uh, Committee, so has a real depth, in-depth understanding of this sector. So please welcome Diana. Lovely, thank you for that introduction, Warren, and um, we will explain uh, complex social policy risk throughout the course of the day. Thank you. Uh, so what I wanted to do uh, before we um, have our speakers um, who are specialists in the disability sector, I just thought it was appropriate that we spend some time just understanding uh, the complexity in the sector and how it affects everyday lives. So as you can see uh, from this slide, um, with a population of about 22 million people here in Australia, we have approximately 4 million or 20% uh, who report as having a disability. And generally that's resulting from some health condition. Now, 1.3 million of those people have what we refer to as a profound or severe disability. To put this into perspective, uh, what we have is every seven hours um, in Australia, a child is diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. Um, and every 15 hours, a child is born with cerebral palsy. People with a disability in Australia, very sadly, only represent 50% are likely to be employed, um, people with a disability are likely to be employed. So 50% of those people presenting with a disability um, have very low economic participation rates. So what we know is economic participation is critical to people's self, um, wellbeing. So that's a significant issue um, socially and economically. So that results in 45% of people 
with a disability in Australia living on or near the poverty line. So we have a very, very real issue and as Matt mentioned in his introduction, there's probably not a person in this room who isn't personally impacted um, by the state of the, the disability sector and the, and, the, and the life issues, the quality of life issues that people in Australia experience with a disability. So the launch of the National Disability Insurance Scheme is absolutely a wonderful thing. Um, we will hear a lot today about the issues and the challenges with that, uh, but keeping in mind this is addressing one of our greatest um, social issues that we have in this country. So what is the National Disability Insurance Scheme? Well, it's an insurance scheme. Um, which means that it is quite different from the welfare models that we, have, that we have seen to date in supporting people in our communities with a disability. Um, and as an insurance scheme, it works on the principle of investing early to reduce the long-term costs. So it, it is classic risk prevention for all of us risk professionals out there. Uh, we love it. Uh, so using the example of someone with autism, if we think about their economic, their ability to um, particip economic participation, uh, if we invest in them early um, and build their skills and um, make the most of their, their abilities, their chances of being able to participate in the workforce as, as adults is vastly increased as opposed to the welfare model, which is a drip feed and it takes years and years and years to actually even get to the point where you might get some supports. And for young children particularly, what that means is that many of the neural pathways and things that will help them develop some of those skills, they've lost that great opportunity of time of, of that occurring. So early investment, a lovely insurance principle, um, is, is fundamental to the scheme. The scheme is administered by the National Disability Insurance Agency, uh, so you'll hear that mentioned throughout the course of today. So that's an independent Commonwealth Government agency whose sole purpose is um, in implementing the NDIS and the ongoing management. So just to touch again on, on uh, the four insurance principles that you will see clearly throughout the design of the scheme. Um, so it's, it's all based on actuarial um, estimates. So what are, and this is another term you'll hear, the reasonable and necessary support needs um, of the target population. So those people with a disability that are identified as meeting the criteria for the scheme, um, th their funding is based on, on the necessary supports. So it does take that lifetime approach, as I used in the example of the child with autism. Uh, so invest early to build their capability so that they can um, participate in the community um, as we should all be entitled to do. Uh, it, it is also designed to continually build markets and, in, and invest in research and encourage innovation. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit about that as well today. Um, so it, it is able to, instead of being this sort of fragmented system where funding is coming from all different sources and navigating where you might be able to get support, it's now taking a, a, a systematic approach um, to, to the management of supports for people with a disability. So that's, that's a, a, um, an overview of what we're going to hear um, quite a lot about in the next little while. So to, to move into that, it's my very great pleasure to introduce David Moody, who is the State Manager of National Disability Services. Uh, National Disability Services is the peak body um, nationally for all the disability service providers, and it's about 1,100... 1,100 nationally, more than 200. Yes, that's right. So um, they, you know, many of your clients, uh, if they're providing services in the disability sector, will be um, part of the NDS. So, David is the State Manager. During his career, David has worked as a lawyer and salary partner at Slater and Gordon um, in various director's roles at WorkSafe Victoria. And he was also the Assistant Director, NDI Secretariat at the Department of Premier and Cabinet during the uh, transition stage and development stage. Um, 
he worked at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services and we worked out, we, we think we were there at the same time at some point. Yes, yeah. Um, he was the Director of Budget Strategy and Corporate Planning. Uh, and that was all before starting his current role as the State Manager of NDS in July 2015. Please join me in welcoming David. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me here today. And in particular, I just want to acknowledge um, um, Jim and Diana and Warren for um, their kindness in um, allowing us to present today, but also um, in terms of their, um, their approach to um, national disability services in the first place to develop um, um, you know, the relationship we have which sees me speaking with you here today. Um, I want to continue by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, their elders past and present, and any elders present here today from other communities. Uh, from the oldest civilisation the world has ever known. Um, my brief is pretty simple, to talk about the NDIS, its challenges and opportunities. And in that regard, to give you some level of insight into what your clients or prospective clients may be, are going through at the moment. Um, it's fair to say that um, um, the phrase disruptive change, I suppose, we'd, well, I think we'd all have to agree, has almost become a bit of a cliche in terms of how often it's used and in what circumstances. But it's fair to say that the National Disability Insurance Scheme for providers in our sector, and I'm pleased and honoured to be accompanied here today by Rowan Brady, one of the chief executives from um, one of our members, member and enterprises, um, who knows a lot about those challenges and opportunities. Um, it's fair to say that um, the challenges and opportunities in what is a very immature scheme have proved um, well, certainly the challenges have proved to be particularly significant in the first six months of full scheme rollout, and I'm keen to discuss those with you today. Okay. I want to discuss how the scheme's working and is supposed to work, the challenges for providers, consumers, and their care and support networks, the new but as yet unmade national quality and safeguarding framework, um, which will underpin quality and safeguarding under the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and changing models of workforce and workforce strategy, which we are certainly seeing starting to crystallise under the NDIS. The scheme, at the risk of getting st st diving straight into the legislation, is actually supported by Commonwealth legislation, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act, the NDIS Act 2013. And Diane has already talked about the scale of disability in this country in terms of you know, 4 million people with disability, perhaps 2.2 million people with significant disability. It needs to be borne in mind that this scheme is not intended to be a panacea for every disability in Australia. It represents basically, on one view, about 25% well, or there, or in fact less than that, perhaps 12.5% um, of the total number of people with disability who will be eligible to be clients under the scheme, 460 to 475,000 people with significant disability, people who are under the age of 65 at the time the scheme rolls into their part of the world where they're living, people, um, um, pe people who um, have a disability um, which requires which is ongoing, which is permanent, um, which is serious and which impacts their social and economic participation, or people and or people who require early intervention in order to optimise their um, life outcomes. The scheme is not a case of you get everything and a set of steak knives when it comes to supports. Um, in order um, to access supports, um, a participant must be able to demonstrate that the support is reasonable and necessary, both. And that's certainly presented some opportunities and challenges for many scheme participants already. Okay. Just to basically briefly take you through the concept of reasonable and necessary, the support must assist the participant, the person with disability. I hate that jargon, but that, nevertheless, that's what the people, people with disability are described as under the Act. The support will assist the participant to pursue their goals, objectives and aspirations. The support will assist the participant's social and economic participation. It will represent, quote unquote, value for money, and that phrase does appear in the Act. It will be effective and beneficial, and the funding or provision of support considers what is reasonable to expect families, carers, informal networks and the community to provide. And that's proving to be particularly critical because, of course, um, insofar as families and, care and carers networks have historically provided a lot of informal support, there's ongoing, I hesitate to use the word battles, but certainly dis debates and disputes um, between providers, participants and the agency as to the extent to which it's reasonable to expect families and carers to continue to provide a level of informal support in circumstances where those supports might otherwise be funded. And insofar as they are funded, those families and carers may therefore be released, I hesitate to use the phrase, but released to actually, for example, undertake work of their own, paid work of their own in terms of optimising economic outcomes. 
And the other, the other criteria is that the support is most appropriately funded or provided through the NDIS. And there's another challenge in that regard, because of course that phrase is intended to also draw the reader to the fact that state governments, traditionally the funders of mainstream services, are not um, allowed or not being allowed to vacate the field in terms of some of the supports they've historically provided to people with disability through mainstream services. It's not a case that every single support that a child with disability going to school may require is going to be funded under the NDIS. There's this agreement between Commonwealth and state governments that says, for example, that insofar as these supports are necessary for the child to undertake education, that those supports should be continued to, funded, continue, continue to be funded by the state, by, by the Victorian government in our case. But insofar as those supports are required by the child for general purposes, for example, if they, required, if they require support to go to the toilet, they'll require it whether, whether or not they're at or outside of school, then a support of that nature will be funded under the, under the NDIS. And if that definition is as clear as mud to you, it's because it, it's a function of an agreement struck by the Council of Australian Governments in, in a, basically in a period of an afternoon, after about six to 12 months worth of work by state and Commonwealth government officials. Um, it's fair to say that there is still a lot of grey in terms of what's in and what's outside the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which in and of itself represents challenges for your prospective clients, providers of disability services. Now, Diane has already traversed some of, this, um, some of the detail on the key reforms, um, in terms of the key reforms that the NDIS represents. Um, I suppose what I'd say is that um, from, from the point of view of our sector, um, it's tremendously important that this scheme survives and thrives. The fact of the matter is that historically disability services in this country have been um, chronically underfunded and have never been funded by state governments of any political colour to meet demand for services. For those of you who are not aware, up until the NDIS came along, the Victorian government, for example, both major political parties or political coalitions as the case may be, were overseers of a scheme locally in which the list of people who were determined to have a disability but hadn't yet won the misery lottery, they weren't badly disabled enough, the list was running up to in excess of 3,500 people languishing, waiting for someone to die or no longer require supports and therefore to get off the list and into the space where they are entitled to access supports. And for many of those people that essentially consigned them to a life of isolation and misery. Now, I don't say that the scheme has immediately produced happiness and light, but it certainly, in terms of it being entitlements rather than a ration-based scheme, represents in its concept, if not always in its delivery, delivery, a massive improvement on what the states were, were overseeing in the past in terms of their system. We're seeing um, an increased emphasis under the scheme of choice and control. Again, a potential cliche until you realise that um, the uh, state governments the way that funding is travelling is not from, from governments to providers but from the agency to participants who then get to choose within the context of a plan that they have approved or have agreed with the agency those supports they wish to avail themselves of to achieve particular lifetime goals and aspirations. As uh, I think Diana alluded to, basically um, the funding is indeed in most instances attached to individuals. It changes the relationship between governments, clients and providers. And it's certainly, in terms of how it's been designed, producing already a new and potentially more competitive market for disability services. I say potentially because some, you know, in terms of what we're seeing right at the moment, we are seeing a certain level of market consolidation amongst providers already in the sector. I don't think it would be um, a correct assertion for anyone to make to say that what we're seeing is a, a massive number of new and innovative supports coming out, out and about at the moment. What we're starting to see is the growth of a new market for services. But to the extent that, and we'll talk about some of the challenges, to the, to the extent that some of the challenges are proving particularly challenging for some providers, in some instances we're actually seeing rather than an increase in choice of provider, in some parts of Australia we're seeing a contraction because some providers, let's be very frank, are not going to survive the NDIS because of the way it's been designed. So let's talk about the way it's been designed and what's different. For participants, but um, 
Um, for participants, they get to decide what supports they need, how to use their funding and who will provide their supports. For providers, it means they're engaged by participants to deliver supports in accordance with their plan, with the participants' plan. Funding is allocated to participants and not the provider, and providers enter into a service agreement with participants setting out the individualised supports they will deliver. Funding goes with a participant wherever they live. In other words, we no longer have this situation where if you were moving from Camberwell to Coolangatta, um, essentially you'd have to re-establish your eligibility in Queensland in order to get access to the same supports that you were getting in Victoria. That no longer is the case, thank God. And prov providers are paid retrospectively rather than prospectively for the delivery of services. So it's not just a change in the funding model, it represents a, a you know, systemic reform or sy systems reform as well. So how, how is it working at the moment? Let's turn in particular to Victoria. The Victorian government agreed with the Commonwealth back in 2013 to a rollout schedule, as it's called, which will see within a period of three years 105,000 people with disability rolling into the scheme as NDIS participants. In order to make that happen as seamlessly or at least as well as possible, um, the government's agreed as to how the rollout would occur in terms of particular rollout sites. What you're seeing here is the rollout schedule. So the Barwon trial site centred around Geelong has already been and gone in terms of it's now in full scheme. It's finished up in 2016. North East Melbourne area with about 10,300 clients um, potentially there um, commenced on 1 July 2016. But although we're now at what, September 2007 or August 2017, that rollout still hasn't concluded for a number of reasons we can talk about. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these in turn, and I should emphasise I'm happy to provide a PDF version of these slides to ANSVAR for circulation to the group. Suffice it to say that in the second year of rollout, being 2017-18, this is when rubber really starts to hit the road. In the second year of rollout, um, seven new rollout sites will go into the scheme, and in the third year of rollout, there will be um, a significant number of um, other sites, including some of the largest, being Southern Region, where demand growth is projected to be the largest in Victoria, centred around Daniel, and Western Region, which, in case you haven't been reading the papers, represents the um, yeah, fastest, fastest demographic, demographic growing area, demographic growth of any area in Australia. Um, suffice it to say, and despite the fact that we're talking about moving 105,000 people into the scheme in Victoria within three years, the agency itself would describe that as being a, a languid pace, a slow pace. Um, when compared, for example, to what's going on in New South Wales, where they're, they're transitioning over a period of two years, 150,000 clients, ending by 1 July of next year. So we're, we're, we're supposed to be grateful that it's only over three years, but I've, I've got to say to you, I don't know too many of our members who um, think that the pace is languid, and I wouldn't blame them. In terms of um, some background of the scheme, um, this comes, and for those of you who are interested in what your clients or your prospective clients are dealing with, the NDIA's quarterly reports um, certainly are one, a very rich source of data and increasingly rich, it must be said. I think the last, the last report ran to about 267 pages, of, um, very, you know, of, which was comprised of a lot of data. You're looking at more, more than 75,000 participants in the scheme nationwide. Um, you're looking at um, tw uh, 88% of those who are in the scheme um, considering that um, their experience was um, good or very good. 87% of participants believe, believe in their plan would make their life better. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the most important stats in terms of providers, 6,814 service providers have registered, had registered after the third quarter. Now, on current figures, on current indications, that figure is closer to 8,000. So what we're seeing is an exponential increase in the number of registered providers under the NDIS. But we need to dig a bit deeper into the data to understand those figures. About 30% of those um, providers are for-profit organisations, and a significant proportion of those providers are allied health professionals moving into this space. Many of them are sole practitioner or um, partnership type arrangements. Um, and as importantly as anything else, although there's been an exponential increase in the number of providers moving into the sector, in terms of the number who are actually doing the work, on current estimates it's about 35 per cent of that, that 6,800 who are actually providing services. So if, you know, ours is a sector which is still um, coming to grips with the notion of risk and strategic risk, but in, if you want to see how, in, a, in an overarching sense, the sector is treating the scheme, 
yeah, there's a lot of new providers who are registering to become um, uh, providers of services, but two thirds of them are holding their water, just waiting to see how the market matures before they decide to jump, which I think is an indication of some, the assessment that some providers who aren't yet providing services, um, an indication of how they're assessing risk and challenges associated with the scheme. Further to that, in every year NDS is the national peak body for non-government disability service providers produces what we call a state of the sector report. Um, this gives you, if you like, a bird's eye view of how the sector is responding to, in this instance, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. As a result of last year's state of the sector report, which um, uh, was the result of a survey of about 550 of our leaders within the sector, Australia-wide, we are able to say with some confidence that there's an increasing um, level of merger activity, that consolidation I was talking about before. We can say that demand for services is growing rapidly, but that many providers are facing challenges in terms of meeting that demand. That clients are exercising choice. 58% of those who were surveyed indicated they'd lost a client to another provider in the sector in the first year. And in a commercial market, that's no news to anyone. But I have to say that that's actually that, that in some respects, that starts to illustrate the, the, the size of the change in our sector, bearing in mind that historically, government would provide funding to providers to provide services to clients who are literally brought, brought to the door of the, of, of the provider in order to, to access those services. But now what we're seeing is the, start, is, is, is the exercise of, or the beginnings of the exercise of consumer choice on the part of NDIS participants. Providers are diversifying in terms of the nature of the services they're providing, which represents risks and opportunities at the same time. 48% of those surveyed um, indicated they were entering the new service markets. And achieving a surplus is tough. 22% 20, of those surveyed indicated they had made a loss in the last financial year. And one of the, one of the, um, and, and one of the, uh, the stats, which isn't on this slide, I'm happy, well, not happy to tell you, but I think I need to tell you, perhaps 7% of those surveyed indicated they were at risk of, running in, of going to voluntary administration in the next 12 months, which is no small thing when you're a leader of your organisation, even if you're saying it within the privacy of a survey, to concede even to yourself that you might be going under within 12 months. So it's challenging times for our sector in terms of coming to grips with the new environment. So in terms of coming to grips with that environment, some of the risks faced by providers, we're talking about what have historically been welfare and community organisations, not-for-profit organisations. Can I just say I hate that term? They're profit-for-purpose organisations. If they're not making a profit of some sort, one which is capable of being reinvested back into their organisation for the betterment of their client group, they're going into administration. But nevertheless, um, we're moving from welfare and community organisations to organisations which are aware and aware of the importance of becoming sustainable community businesses. We're seeing significant changes to contractual arrangements with governments, which I alluded to before. Um, the contract is now with the individual um, customer or consumer, and they're not a consumer who is particularly sophisticated. And that's not being cruel or rude, that's just being practical. The fact of the matter is that the consumer of disability services is by definition a person with significant disability. And so working with that person as your, if you like, the buyer of your services can often prove particularly challenging for providers, particularly where the consumer is able to sever their relationship with the provider and may not be aware of, the, of who is actually, of the nature of the services that are being provided with and in some cases be really challenged in terms of expressing a view regarding the services they want because, let's be honest, they have a cognitive disability in many cases. In fact, in about 70% of cases, consumers of these services um, have been um, assessed as having a cognitive disability. So there are particular risks and challenges for providers who are entering, in, entering into this new contractual relationship. And I'm not being rude to consumers of these services. It is a practical reality. Um, in terms of, um, uh, we're seeing the cessation of block funding, that is government basically literally de delivering up a block of funding or a, a, you know, a lump sum of funding to deliver particular programs and instead what we're seeing is services which are being individualised. We're seeing um, some significant issues in regards to the price for services. I can go into that in more detail later, but in fact, why don't I go into it a little bit now? Suffice it to say that when we're talking about the cap price for services under the NDIS, this is why it's not a free market. 
that's being overseen by the agency, but an open market with particular caveats. Under the scheme, the price for services is underpinned by a number of assumptions and it's a very lean price. And this is why it's proving challenging for some of our provider members to actually keep their heads above water. And I cannot blame them for one minute. Not when the price for some services, when, in fact for all services, is underpinned by assumptions such as staff who are working full time won't get more than two days training a year. Staff who are working um, part time, and that's essentially the bulk of our, our workforce, um, it's assumed that they'll only need half a day's training a year. In the event that any training can be afforded and provided, there is no provision for backfill in the assumptions which underpin the price. 95% uh, of any price is assumed to be dedicated to the delivery of frontline services. So the other bit is essentially assumed to be for everything else, payroll, finance, accounts, HR, etc., etc. Now, if there's people in this room who, I'm sure, in fact, all of you have a very high level of business acumen, let me ask you, if you're running a business where essentially all of, all of your... Um, all of your product, well 95% of, of anything you made on a product was dedicated to the sale of that product and only 5% was everything else, how long do you reckon you'd survive in business? Could I suggest to you it's almost a rhetorical question. So these are challenging times. The prices are very lean. It's fair to say that National Disability Services continues to make the case to the agency um, through various forums it's established for these discussions, thankfully, um, not because we represent a group of rapacious providers who just want to make more and more money, but because we represent a group of providers who are particularly keen to provide services of quality to people with disability whilst ensuring that they have the ability to reinvest and innovate in the provision of new services into the future. There's general uncertainty around the adequacy of the operating model. Practical example, 1 July 2016, the commencement of the rollout of the NDIS. On that same day, the IT system to support the scheme crashed. It crashed. I, one of my, one of, I said to one of my younger staff at NDS, look, it's just like Y2K. And they looked at me wisely and said, well, no, it's not, David. I said, why not? And they said, because Y2K didn't happen. This did. Um, in some respects, it's probably, I think, one of the proudest moments for our sectors in the short time I've been at NDS because very few providers, if any, broke cover and went to the media about the fact that in some cases, I know, because I was taking the calls, they were holding $2 million worth of um, unpaid fees for services already rendered because our sector and our providers want the scheme to work and, didn't, and, and, and saw the strategic dangers in being too critical of the scheme too early. Now, that's not to say that there weren't a lot of concerns in our sector about the viability of many of the providers based upon the fact that the portal had crashed. But within two months, the portal was back online, and it's fair to say now even the agency, yeah, within two months. Um, so I saw that look. Um, <laughs> I suppose, um, just to illustrate, for those of you who aren't as familiar with um, the profit for purpose sector as perhaps um, others in the room, um, I've, I literally had conversations with chief executives who were saying things like, look, we always thought we'd be going without any income for a couple of months, but David, three or four. And I'm thinking, Geez, in, in, in the for-profit sector, if you were literally without income for two, for two months, you'd be actually, you know, well, you'd be going to the Australian for a start. You'd certainly be complaining to somebody. But it probably illustrates the, the mission-based focus of so many providers in this sector, the not-for-profit sector, that what they were concerned about was, A, continuing to keep the doors open and provide services to clients, and B, keeping themselves afloat while the agency in its $22 billion worth of funding got itself right. So think on that in terms of the culture of your potential clients. Who, um, the, the providers of disability services. Um, <clears throat> and I should say the portal still isn't perfect now, by any means. The agency itself talks about, and I quote, 300 pain points uh, in terms of the, um, some of the challenges represented by the portal. Yeah, people say, yeah, but that's just the IT system. Yes, it is the IT system, and it's a mechanism through which participants and providers actually finalise their, their contractual relations and the payment of fees. So it's of more than a little import and represents a particular risk um, for providers and indeed participants, but particularly providers who are trying to keep their doors open. Um, it's also true that providers in this space are operating with what might be described as limited market information. Now, some of you may know that the agency released um, what it called market position statements last year, which were intended to inform the market, capital T, capital M, about what, you know, what it might expect to see out there in terms of where demand is. Now, those market position statements were, we regarded, were what we regarded as a good effort at the time, based on a paucity of data from a sector which has only ever been funded in the past on the basis of outputs rather than outcomes. 
and which has been run by eight different state, state government-based services um, departments. But the fact of the matter is that there is still a very significant piece of work to be done around understanding better how that market growth, that demand growth, is actually comprised. We don't know, based upon the data, for example, in particular regions, where clients are living, the prospective, prospective clients are living in terms of local government areas. We don't know what their age is. We don't know what their primary disability may be in terms of future demand growth. We certainly don't have that data to hand. We don't yet know um, uh, what services they may have a particular interest in purchasing. And therefore, that represents challenges for any senior leader in our sector trying to get ahead of the game in terms of anticipating what demand might look like. We continue to make the case to the agency for a vast improvement in the granularity of that data, and we continue to be optimistic that it will be delivered. Hopefully. Okay. In terms of other risks that your, um, your clients and prospective clients face, um, in fact, most of these I've gone through, um, so I won't, I won't um, trouble you with all, with all of them again. Um, there is a real challenge around, and to use a phrase, it's a wonderful phrase in the slide pack, offering supports outside of capability without proper risk assessment. It's a, fa it's a fact of the matter, and I referred to the support networks before, as well as people with disability. When our providers' staff go into a community or into a home, they are probably as disempowered as anyone can be in terms of providing services to a consumer who may be supported by a network of family members who are also sitting in the lounge room at the same time. So when they're told, you don't need to wait for a second person to execute that lift, or can't you just basically do that yourself? You know, why can't you put that person to bed by yourself? Um, you know, or can I help you? I'm 85 and I've got a bad back, but hey, can I help you lift, lift my son or daughter into bed? Sometimes, I'll, well, most of the time, they'll say yes. That worker will say yes. And in terms of the potential for there to be particular risks which crystallise around injury to that worker, um, abuse of that worker, challenges for that worker in just in terms of continuing to want to work in the workplace, um, it's certainly um, an ongoing discussion that we're having not only with the agency but also with OHS agencies around Australia. We're facing particular difficulties in recruiting staff to our sector. The Victorian government, to its credit, in our view, um, uh, has recognised the scale of the problem and is talking in terms of um, having rolled out an, uh, uh, an NDIS workforce action plan, which could be just so much of a utopia-type a utopia um, um, episode for those of you who are students of that program. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is it is underpinned by $26 million worth of funding across nine different projects intended to grow a quality workforce in Victoria. Because in Victoria alone, on current demand projections, we need to grow the workforce by about 18,100 over the next four to five years. Nationally, we need to grow that workforce by 70,000. So there are risks attendant upon the fact we still don't have clarity as to where they're going to come from, what qualifications, qualities, values and behaviours they'll need to have and how they'll get them if they don't have them already, how we ensure that having attracted the next generation of disability support workers, assuming we know where they've come from, um, how we'll keep them, given that, let's not kid ourselves, the wages at the moment for being a disability support worker aren't exactly at a premium. So there are a, you know, a vast array of risks for providers, potentially your clients, in terms of the management of that workforce and ensuring there is a critical mass of workers available, in some instances, where services need to be provided. Okay. There's a, there's an, 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 I'm just looking at Diana to make sure I'm not going over time. Yeah. No worries. Um, um, there's a vast array of risks, um, risks, opportunities, mostly risk in this case, around the management of specialist disability housing um, and different roles and responsibilities vis-à-vis -vis the owner or manager of the house on the one hand and the provider of supports, support independent living services within the house on the other. Um, the NDIA, the agency's preference, is that if you own the house, or rather, if you manage, if you manage specialist disability accom, usually about five bedroom, a five-bedroom accommodation. If you manage specialist disability accom, you, you're not also providing the services within it, which has got a series of risks, a suite of risks attached to that, that model, which I'm sure you can, only, uh, I'm sure you can imagine. Um, for example, um, as uh, apart from anything else, if you've got five clients in the house, each of them is entitled, on one view, to have, um, you know their own array of um, providers within that house. So potentially, um, in an extreme example, you could have anything up to 40 different organisations sort of like 
barrelling in and out of the house over a period of a day or two or three or five, as the case may be. Um, managing those risks if you are the manager of the property um, is challenging at least. Separate agreements, service agreements are, be, uh, are required in terms of um, agreements between the participant on the one hand and the, uh, the person who owns or manages the specialist disability or com and the organisation which provides support and independent living. And uh, in terms of, um, uh, there's a reference there to significant, uh, so these are significant issues for current NGOs operating in New South Wales owned older properties. I apologise for that. I thought I'd eliminated all reference to New South Wales in this presentation. Um, suffice it to say, um, it's not, it's, um, that reference is there because um, uh, in uh, New South Wales there are a large number of what we call legacy properties. It must be said there's a large number of legacy properties in Victoria as well, otherwise known as old properties which are in various states of maintenance and disarray, as the case may be. Um, there are real challenges in terms of um, the complexity of um, working with clients who are, have complex needs. The fact of the matter is that one of the key areas of challenge for, um, in terms of workforce development is getting a workforce which is capable of supporting people with, um, who require positive behaviour support, active support and, high, and support for high intensity and complex needs. That's skilled work how to get the critical mass of people to do that work. And in the absence of being able to, the risks are tended upon workers who may not have the qualifications doing that work anyway. In terms of the National Quality and Safeguarding Framework, um, we welcome this. I mean, that may be of surprise to some of you in the room, but as the National, as the national Peak for um, Disability Service Providers, we actively support a National Quality and Safeguarding Framework underpinned by legislation, as this will be. Um, we particularly do because we think that um, um, by, by going down this path um, there will be a level of assurance, hopefully, through the National Quality and Safeguarding Commission that people with disability will not have to um, be as concerned of the, as they will have had to have been in the past about being the subject of disability abuse and neglect, that people with disability will have the ability to um, uh, access quality services as distinct from uh, perhaps producing a pink bats mark II type scenario. One of the things that we particularly welcome about this legislation is that hopefully it will over time see the elimination of bottom feeders, attracted by the honeypot honey of $22 billion per annum um, in, an, in an NDIS year-on-year yeah, -year government underpinned through the NDIS. Um, we uh, welcome uh, the um, establishment of a national code of conduct for the workforce. Um, we have concerns that about attempts to apply that code of conduct to um, providers, not because we don't think providers should be held to a standard, but because we think that trying to actually fit both providers and workers within the same code of conduct produces some perverse outcomes. For example, the draft code of conduct makes reference to um, uh, um, it, uh, inappropriate sexual misconduct um, as being just not on. Fair enough too. But the fact of the matter is that no organisation can ever be guilty of sexual misconduct, only individuals can be. So in terms of like illustrating how there needs to be a separation there, I mean that's my particular example between the code of conduct for workers on the one hand and disability standards for providers on the other. Um, we uh, um, also welcome the fact that, there are pe that um, the, uh, the quality and safeguarding framework makes provision for penalties, which I know was of surprise to some in our sector. Um, it's not to say that everybody should get a whack every time anything goes wrong, it's to say that essentially there should be consequences for bad behaviour. And that's not a radical statement. If it is, tell me, but that is not a radical statement. Um, we're trying to actually work with some of the most vulnerable people in our community in a way which basically ensures they can live happily and safely in an ordinary life. Um, to um, contemplate doing that without appropriate safeguards and penalties for breach um, would, in, in certainly in our view, appear to be somewhat idiotic. In terms of uh, changing workforce models, um, I've covered this off a little bit. I suppose. My signal example of just how much the workforce is changing is to invite you to go to Gumtree, the website, and look up next to the second-hand drum kits and cabinets and all the rest of it, disability support worker. And you will find hundreds put, who have already put out their shingle saying, I'm a disability support worker, I've got Cert 1 in, uh, I've got cert one in this and I've got First Aid Cert 2 and therefore I can provide you with services if you as a participant in the scheme are self-managing and want to engage me because you can self-manage in certain circumstances as a participant under the scheme. So it's a workforce which I call it a bit, I must confess, I call it a bit um, like the Wild West at the moment, the way the workforce um, um, debate is going. Um, it needs, in our view, to 
have a great deal more rigour around it in terms of the policy that underpins the development of that workforce. Um, it's not to say that those, those disability support workers advertising on Gumtree and other sites aren't fantastic at their job. It, it is to say that at the moment it's impossible to say that with any confidence at all. And that's a problem when, you're, as I say, you're working with some of the most vulnerable um, um, people in our community with challenging behaviours. Um, we're facing challenges in terms of needing to grow the sector by about 70,000 um, and in terms of jobs being advertised, perhaps a third of them go unfilled when, when they are advertised. We're facing challenges in terms of not getting enough suitable applicants for the jobs and that's not a case of providers being choosy, it's a case of providers being sensible as to the sorts of people and their values and behaviours and qualities and qualifications that we want working in our sector. Um, we're facing challenges in terms of the nature of the work. Um, uh, we're seeing short hours, on average about 22 hours per week being offered, often casualised and um, therefore um, producing a small pool of applicants. We're seeing in the allied health sector a shift from full-time to fixed-term roles. So what we're seeing, I suppose, to give you the, the general view, is an increasing instance of precarious employment at a time when the health and human service sector is the fastest growing sector of work employment in Australia. It's estimated to, be, to eventually be bigger than the mining boom itself in terms of employment numbers that it produces. So our challenge, and the challenge for all providers in our sector, is how to create the workforce of the future, the one that wants to stick around and is attracted to and retained by our sector, which can over time see a career path for itself and opportunities to professionalise and the like. Again, that shouldn't be radical in any sector, but it, and I don't suggest it's completely radical in ours, but it certainly represents a challenge. We know when we ask our current work, um, we, we, we know when, uh, as a result of recent research produced by the Un University of New South Wales, that current staff in the sector are under the pump. They're concerned about their employment conditions, they're concerned about fluctuating pay and in insecure work. They're concerned because they're increasingly working remotely and unsupervised about the loss of sense of teamwork, physical and mental health risks, which, which, which I alluded to before. Um, they're not sure that, about their levels of job satisfaction. And they're frustrated by their inability to provide um, su the support they would want to, in part because of the cap price for services which are currently, currently being paid under the scheme. I invite you to have a look at that paper. What I like about that paper is that it wasn't produced by NDS. It was in fact um, commissioned by three trade unions, um, which we don't always agree with in every, in, in, in every respect, um, and that's a, that's a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, constructive, um, a constructive debate, um, but it nevertheless cited at various points material and research produced by National Disability Services, and it's certainly, um, there's a lot that we found to like about the analysis within that document. In terms of how providers are responding, um, responding to some of these challenges, um, we're there's, there's a focus on reducing overheads and indeed the amount of middle management that's present. Um, we still have significant challenges around tran disability transport and ensuring that people with disability get the transport they require to get to where they want to get to when they need it. Um, we're seeing, um, I've already mentioned mergers and acquisitions, we're seeing diversification and some final considerations. We're seeing some providers who are adopting a business as usual approach to the NDIS and others who are being proactive in their approach to the management of risks. Of the two types, I'd have to say I think those who are being proactive are the sensible ones, given the, the, the scale of change the scheme represents. We're seeing, um, uh, this is my experience now, we are definitely seeing an increased capacity, but it was coming off a low base, of boards and directors to understand and assess risks. That's still a journey for many in the sector. As I alluded to at the start, I think strategic risk is still an area where many of our boards and board directors um, could stand some serious improvement, but certainly that's gradually coming into the sector. When we're, we're seeing an increased level of understanding amongst providers because of the financial presses, pressures of the cost of providing particular services. And in that regard, we are seeing providers who are making the decision proactively to get out of providing particular services because the costs cannot be met by the price they get for those services, which is an unusual position for profit-for-purpose for, profit, um, uh, profit for organ organisations to be in. Where, um, yeah, it's certainly an environment in which existing mitigation stra strategies in terms of risk um, may no longer apply because of the changing environment. 
an environment in which the capacity to undertake risk assessment of existing and new supports, um, uh, I don't say it's increased, I say it's become even more necessary because of the nature of the scheme. Um, we are seeing providers who are exploring new and innovative ways of offering sustainable supports, but nothing like what the agency will in some of its public presentations suggest is happening. I mean, that's not because ours is a sector that doesn't want to be innovative, it's because the cap price for services makes innovation, well, apart from anything else, it makes the realisation of cash reserves very challenging. And without cash reserves and significant cash flow, then talking in terms of innovation when you're just trying to keep your head above water is a particular challenge. So we are seeing, if you like, the, the seedlings of innovation, but I wouldn't like to kid you that it's just happening ubiquitously across the whole of Australia at the moment. And all of that is likely to create, you'll be unsurprised to learn, new insurance scenarios. If after everything I've said, and I, I apologise if I've raced through the last couple of slides, um, um, you have an abiding interest in learning more about the probably the most significant social policy initiative in Australia's history, if not since Medibank at least, um, then there, is a range, there are a range of re recent reports and papers that you might wish to avail yourself of. Um, one, and I am biased here, but I think it's a particularly good one to read as a primer around some of the challenges faced under the scheme. One that I'd draw your attention to is one produced by NDS nationally called How to Get the NDIS on Track. It is a reflection in terms of the analysis that's been done of feedback from our members at the coalface working within the scheme. It produces a, a fair critique in our view, a constructive critique of some of the challenges um, presented by the scheme in its, first, in its first 12 months of operation and how those challenges can be met in terms of price, in terms of the quality of planning, in terms of growing the workforce, in terms of issues around employment, um, etc, etc. But in any event, that slide has been produced and will be reproduced through the PDF for your um, reading pleasure. So thanks very much for um, listening uh, this morning. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. wanting to know what these providers need specifically from their service providers, in your view. What providers need from what, what providers need from, ins from insurance from, from our insurance company? Um, well, I think Rowan will go into that in a bit more detail in your presentation potentially. But um, um, basically, what I think that um, based upon what I understand from what our members are telling us, what providers really need from any any organisation seeking to provide them with auxiliary services like insurance, is an understanding of their business, an understanding of the challenges that they, are, that they are facing, and a practical ability to support them to address those challenges, whether it be through insurance or other, or, or, or other services. I know that's, I don't want, that, even as I say it, I, I know it might sound a bit glib, but in all honesty, what our members need, what providers need, is support to get through the early days of the scheme in order for them, having survived in the first 12 to 18 months, to thrive thereafter under the scheme. And if you're in the, in terms of insurance, um, they, need, they, need, they need the support of individuals and organisations who understand the concept of risk, have the ability to support them in assessing risk, and are able to give clear-eyed advice without fear or favour. In my experience, our members are not averse to the challenging conversation around what they're doing well and what they could be doing even better. Um, just inquiring in regards to the, the current funding model, yep. do you see that the funding model is actually requiring providers to actually change the way in which they deliver services and in doing so change their operating model? When they're changing their operating model, is that to a better model or, uh, well, is it, or, or to potential they're, they're addition? Sometimes they're changing the operating model just to make sure that they're able to continue operating a level of service as distinct from necessarily the best quality service. I mean, I'm happy to, without, you know, no names, no pack rule, but I've taken calls from at least two chief executives in our sector in the last, in the last month, for example, um, just exploring with me the potential for them to begin operating in community supports, one-on-one -on -one in community supports, without, and I quote, qualified staff. 
Now, however you define qualified in this case, if it was in a particular level of qualification, because the, price, the cap price for services in the assumption is going to underpin it, they worked out with their boards, don't allow them to be able to afford a person who has, for example, a particular level of certification. So instead what they've done is go back to basics and say, well, look, we'll rely upon a person with the right values and behaviours to support a person with disability in the community because we can't afford someone with a particular qualification. So that's but one example of how providers are responding to some of these challenges. They don't do it willingly, I have to say. They, 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 these scenarios produce some of the biggest debates, I suspect, at board and senior management team meetings about the direction. But they're dealing with a very lean cap price. Any other questions? Was there another question? No. Okay, well, can I just say thank you very much for um, um, hearing what I've had to say today. Um, I appreciate that that was probably a lot to actually get your head around in one, in one sitting. Um, this scheme basically is moving like a, a, run, you know, a runaway train in terms of its pace at the moment. Um, by 2019-20 it will be fully rolled out and that is by no means when all of this discussion and debate around how to make it even better ends. That, in my view, is basically the, that'll be the, big, the, what's, the end of the beginning, at the risk of getting Churchillian about it. Um, the end of the beginning, the five years thereafter, will be a particularly critical period for providers in our sector. And in that regard, we look forward to um, many people in this room being able to support our providers to navigate those risks and challenges and opportunities. Thank you. That was fabulous. That's, uh, that, that is a whirlwind around a very complex um, uh, scheme. So, um, and thank you uh, for your attention uh, during that session. So we are now going to just change the pace a little and hear from Rowan Brady, who is a CEO of one of the organisations who um, is actually right in the middle of, of this transition. So Rowan is the CEO of Mambaran, um, who and he's been there since 2002, so he, he is a stalwart of the disability sector. Uh, he's also a member of the National Disability Service, the member organisation on the Victoria Committee, and is on the national board of uh, National Disability Services. Prior to joining Mamber, and Rowan taught in various schools, both in Australia and internationally, and we were having a, an interesting discussion about how Mamber uh, recruited uh, someone from the education sector uh, to the disability sector around bringing in some skills about around planning um, and and managing for outcomes and putting programs together. So, where the education sector uh, was very accustomed to that, the disability hasn't. So it's very interesting now with the NDIS um, transition where we're moving to that exact model um, that Rowan's uh, previous experience in education is coming to the fore. So please welcome me in, uh, uh, join me in welcoming Rowan Brady. Hi everyone, I'd uh, also like to join David in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the mighty Kulin Nation, and uh, contradict Matt's advice. Um, if I were you, I have to look in the mirror every morning, but I'd move behind the pillar so that you don't have to look in this direction for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, Diana. And I'm in a strange situation for a man my age. I actually have to put my glasses on to see and off to read. It's the opposite to most people, so forgive me for doing that all the time. Um, in terms of where this presentation is pitched, entitled Visioning, yep. that's not, they're not my slides though. No, I just need to click one to go forward, thank you, that threw me, thank you. Um, entitled Visioning Our Future Under the NDIS, I've really pitched this presentation at a governance level, uh, the risks facing the board and perhaps the senior leadership team, the management team of an organisation. Based on those couple of questions at the end of David's presentation, uh, I, I might have uh, got the mark slightly wrong because I, I don't do a lot of detail, but I'm happy to take those questions if we've got time at the end. As David's alluded um, uh, very eloquently, the NDIS does represent a seismic shift 
in the way traditional disability services uh, do business. Um, basically everything is up for grabs, everything's uh, going to be um, disrupted and we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, through the course of this presentation. Uh, I should say I've prepared a fair bit of material. That there, They often say there are two types of people in the world, uh, those that see a glass as half full or, and, or half empty. I'm a third kind. I think, how can I jam the other half into that second glass and I can't get the rest in there? So um, if we don't get through all of the slides, don't worry. I'm like David. I'm also happy to make them available to you uh, uh, in due course. So um, a little bit about Mamron, just to give you a sense of a background. We're an Australian um, public company registered with ASIC uh, and with the usual charitable status, DGR, PBI and all of the things that go with that. We operate through sites uh, throughout the western suburbs of Melbourne. We support, um, it, it, it changes, but somewhere around 500, uh, uh, north of 500 people. And the key um, business lines that we're in, service lines, are community options, uh, supported employment, traineeships and respite. To give you a sense of the size of the business, uh, about 235 staff by headcount or $12 million turnover annually. So I had a look at our objects uh, in our constitution. Uh, I didn't have time to research all the way back to the original constitution some 50 years ago, um, but I, I believe that they won't have changed. Um, the current constitution talks about education, employment, training, support of uh, PWD as a, an acronym for people with disability, cooperate with government, uh, provide resources to families, uh, support people to live independently, necessitous circumstances uh, and uh, educating the general public. Fast forward to 2017, uh, some of our language has changed. Uh, our tagline is empowering people, so if you look back through that list, education and training of people with disabilities, cooperating with government, supporting families, the community and educating the general public, we argue that that all fits um, our empowering people tagline. A vision um, in, is our, our vision is a society where all uh, people are able to live the way they want to and our purpose is we exist to connect people to opportunity and support them to achieve what they want in life um, and a set of values there which I think I'll just flick through quite quickly. Putting the person first, customer centred, um, service excellence, making a difference in people's lives and of course being a part of the community. So thinking about the NDIS as it rolls out uh, across Australia and, and in our patch, as part of our uh, strategic planning, we've asked ourselves three critical questions. Do we understand the landscape, uh, including the current and future challenges uh, that we face? What's our purpose for being here? Uh, and if we couldn't answer that question, we actually were very honest with ourselves and said we have to think about whether we need to be here at all and uh, what adaptations are needed in order to be able to not only survive, um, but to thrive in this new environment that's coming. Two's largely been dealt with through an extensive uh, customer experience project um, uh, that we've conducted over the last 12 months or so, uh, and the purpose I just rattled through in an earlier slide. So I'll mainly be focusing on number one and number three on that slide. So with respect of the landscape, we've been working with um, Steve Sammartino at our board and senior leadership team level. If you don't know Steve, he classifies himself as a futurist. Uh, Roland Nafal, some of you may know, runs a consultancy called Disability Services Consulting. We've been working with him extensively. He knows much more about the day-to-day -day operations of a disability service and I guess he's a realist. We've had a consultant uh, by the name of Mark Clifford working with us for the last 12 months on pricing and costing. Um, so I guess he's a pragmatist and of course NDS are critical partners in our business. And I'm going to call him because I needed, needed another IST, an informationist. Um, did you see what I did there? They're all, it doesn't, it's actually a word. If you Google it, um, informationist is a word but it's from the medical uh, uh, world. And, no, and I'm also going to concentrate on number three. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Mamberan Innovation Fund uh, that we've created within our own organisation. So going to understanding our landscape then, I'm going to look at a couple of little case studies that are, were in the media over the last um, six or seven months or so and uh, see what cues and clues we can get from uh, the environment around us. So the first one uh, was an article that uh, went to print in the Australian Financial Review 6th of October last year, which is my birthday. And when you got into the 
guts of the article, it was like, happy birthday, Rowan. Um, uh, how the disability sector is being Uberized was the title of the article. And it talked about, oh, I should say, these are actually not direct quotes. I've taken the ellipses out and um, just for, the, for readability on the slides, but the, I haven't changed the, the, the meaning at all. Uh, traditional disability organisations had no idea the NDIS was actually going to devastate them. I was already devastated at this paragraph. By 2019-20, government officials are estimating that the attrition rate could exceed 30% of not-for-profits in the country. And traditional service providers completely failed to grasp how the scheme's radical redesign uh, was going to affect them. And only the most agile, nimble and innovative NGOs will manage to survive over the next five years or so. Oh dear. And they also went on to say very few have managed to show any signs of agility or capacity to innovate uh, to date. And to which I say, uh oh. Um, so where's MAMBRA and the signs of agility or capacity to innovate? Well, uh, as part of that work I talked about doing with Steve Sammartino and others, we've been developing our strategic priorities over the last uh, um, 12 months. Well, I should say we've been doing that for the last forever, um, but we've been focusing on a new set over the last 12 months. So we've established a set of uh, values, and uh, both internal and external. The external values I had on the screen briefly there before. The internal values uh, we've set up, I guess you might call them team rules for our board and our senior leadership team so that there are things like no ideas, a bad idea, everyone will be listened to with respect um, and things like that so that we make sure that we don't miss any opportunity uh, to grasp um, uh, improvements uh, as they, uh, wherever they may appear. We established a set of non-negotiables so we said to ourselves um, what are the things that as a values-based organisation we will not do? And some of them are obvious. We won't put our, client, uh, our clients at risk, at physical risk in turn, you know, in, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in any material sense. Uh, and we can talk about dignity of risk at another time, but I'm talking about putting them in harm's way, um, free from freedom from abuse and neglect and that kind of thing. And the, and the converse of that is the FOKs. Where is failure OK? And um, pretty much we define failure being OK as anything that isn't, doesn't breach one of the non-negotiables. Uh, so uh, as long as it's not unethical or illegal or, or that sort of thing, it's generally going to be OK to fail. Although if you take out any material risk to clients, you're pretty much left with only dollar risk. And that's, that's what we came down to. And that's where the innovation fund comes in. I mentioned earlier we've conducted an extensive customer experience project. Uh, the current project's been going for about uh, 12 months, um, but uh, we work, first worked with Mesh Communications um, two or three years ago. Uh, so we've been doing this for some time, looking at the end-to-end -end customer experience. We're looking to develop um, an integrated uh, communications uh, strategy, a multi-channel multi um, marketing and communications plan. We're doing an asset stock take, and for the accountants in the room, we're probably completely debauching the definition of asset. Uh, we're, we're calling an asset uh, not what is on the balance sheet, but anything that we can extract value from. Uh, so our, our people, our, our ideas, our physical location, um, and so on. And as we're establishing that asset stock take, we're looking at things critically to say, are we extracting value from these assets that we hold? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, and if we think we can't, then how can we divest ourselves of those assets if they're of material value? Or how could we partner with another um, organisation or entity that would assist us to, to extract, uh, extract um, appropriate value? And this year, for the first time formally in our budget, the board's approved um, what we've, we've called the Mambran Innovation Fund. Uh, I mentioned earlier 12 million turnover. The fund for this year is $100,000. Um, you can do the maths whether you think that's a lot or a little for, um, for innovation in an organisation. It's certainly a lot for an organisation that, as David mentioned, typically spends every dollar that they get on, uh, on service delivery. And uh, in that project, uh, sorry, in that fund, uh, we're looking to find uh, opportunities to think about how we might be able to do things differently. 
we're using some of the um, design uh, methodology coming out of the IT world, fail fast, fail often, um, and so on, a and uh, trying to see uh, if there are things that we can do smarter um, or, or better. The second case study that I'd like you take, to take you to was in uh, an online um, publication called Pro Bono News. Um, if you are interested in the not-for-profit world, it is worth sub subscribing to Pro Bono News. Uh, it's a free plug for them. It's free and it gives you a whole range of information that's what's going on in the not-for-profit not world across the country. Um, so, okay, another cue, headline, Dig disability disruption takes hold of the NFP sector. Experts warned uh, that, the NF that NFPs must take disruption seriously and transform to survive. They should become digital first and ignoring technology uh, is no longer optional if you want to stay relevant. Any advice how to do that pro bono news? Well, uh, they also suggest that large scale reforms are forcing the sector to think about technology strategically. Uh, they're going to need effective client and case management systems, and I think you might have something to say about that later on, Diana, um, to deliver their services effectively. They need to think about digital marketing and website and social media if they're going to survive uh, the NDIS. Okay, so we've got a bit of a signpost forward. Now, this slide um, uh, was going to be a video, but we've decided uh, not to show it today because of time constraints. So if you, whoops, is that still up there? Yes. Um, so if you make a note of it and, and you're, it's something that you'd like to learn more about if you're not fully cognizant of the notion of digital, uh, disruptive innovation, it's only a five minute YouTube video from uh, Queensland University um, University of Technology, and, and I think it's brilliant to explain what's happening. I should say uh, a bit of a disclaimer, digital um, disruptive innovation and uh, digital disruption are actually not quite the same beast, but they're really degrees um, along the same spectrum. So the Pro Bono News article talked about digital disruption, and Wikipedia, that uh, great source of knowledge, defines digital disruption as the change that occurs when you digital technologies and business models affect the value proposition uh, of existing goods and services. Uh, so affect the value proposition. I had on the slides before the disability sector is being Uberized. I wanted to think a little bit more about uh, Uber with you. While the disruptive hype of Uber is often deafening, it actually uh, it remains a relatively a small player in the point-to-point -point transport space. Um, Uber represents only 6% of the market uh, of point-to-point -point transport in Australia. That figure is about 12 months old, so it might be a little bit higher now. For the amount that we're hearing about Uber, and last night again, uh, was it yesterday morning I was in Sydney, but there was a, a taxi blockade on Melbourne Airport because of Uber now having a rank uh, at Melbourne Airport. 6% of market share. Uh, it did actually surprise me when I found that. Uh, and in fact, um, they say that a rising tide lifts all boats. I found some data from, uh, I'm sorry, I think it was PwC, I can look it up if, you, if you'd like me to, uh, that talked about the advent of Uber in Australia um, has actually brought $50 million of new business to the point-to-point -point market. So Uber's certainly grown to 6% of market share, but it hasn't all been extracted from the taxis. The whole market has risen, uh, and this is the price difference um, has encouraged those who are otherwise uh, priced out of the point-to-point -point transport service to enter the market. So I thought that was quite an interesting analogy for the disability uh, sector. And the other thing to think about is that disruptors are often launch with great gr uh, fanfare, um, but then they don't. And uh, initially, if they don't get significant market share, um, they seem to. Uh, drop out of sight to some degree, and I'm sure you can think of examples like that over time. But my uh, observation is that they're often gurgling away uh, in the background only to re-emerge bigger and brighter at some later point, and I call that, so they've had this launch and then they <coughs> seem to drop away, drop out of the of, um, popular consciousness and then have a re-emergence later on. And I call that um, bit in the middle the well of deception, whereas a current um, provider in that market uh, it's easy to get tricked into thinking that they've gone away for good. So the Uber example that I was thinking about with the disability um, space in mind, uh, generally Uber cars are not wheelchair friendly, wheelchair accessible. Uh, so you think, well, that's a part of the market that Uber hasn't got access to. 
I would be very surprised if the uh, uh, head honchos at Uber are not talking with the taxi director right now to say, you've got all these taxis being put off the road that can't afford to do business, and some of them are wheelchair accessible. How about we do a deal and uh, create a market through the NDIS so we'll get some funding in order to be able to provide an Uber service for wheelchair taxis? Actually, if no one's thought of that, I might do that myself and um, get out of this space and actually start to pay the money that I think I'm worth. Um, it's pretty good. I pretty good idea. Sorry, dropping everything here. So, uh, let's look at some um, real disruptors in the uh, disability sector. It's one to think. It's one thing to think about it from a uh, hypothetical point of view or cross industry point of view. But these things are happening right now. We've got websites, and um, feel free to you know to Google them and look them up at your leisure. But there's one called Care Navigator and one called Clickability. These are the trip advisors for NDIS. Um, Clickability costs my organisation, I, I think it's about $800 a year to be listed on it. Um, it's just so that people, uh, when they go searching, Dr Google, Disability Service Western Melbourne, and Clickability's got one of the high uh, SEO, um, uh, SERP outcomes in that search uh, will bring uh, Mambran up uh, on their website. Better caring and higher up. Now these are, I, I hesitated to call them the, the, um, the tinder of the disability sector. I didn't want to sound smutty at all. But these are participant and worker matchmaking services. David mentioned uh, Gumtree where the individual worker is touting their services. These are actual uh, hubs that are advertising matching services for participant and worker. Um, the, there's tap to donate technology, I'm sure you, you've seen that already, and I've put pay in there. I, as far as I know, there are no organisations that are encouraging uh, participants to bring their credit card and getting, having a mobile um, ATM and tapping on it uh, as services have been delivered and charging their credit card directly, but there's no reason why that couldn't be happening right now. Uh, I know of apps that have been developed, uh, both commercially and uh, non-commercially, for people with disabilities and service providers. And we ourselves are dappling with, in virtual reality, and I've um, been to a presentation the other day of another service has already got a prototype developed um, with government funding assistance to uh, train workers in providing disability supports through a virtual reality app. So there's activity across the digital spectrum in the disability sector. It is terribly, terribly exciting, but it also takes significant bandwidth uh, to stay across it all, I have to say. And coming back to uh, Mambran's experience, so what are we doing uh, in this space? Well, uh, Diana mentioned uh, that we've developed our own um, enterprise resource planning system. Uh, we did that about nearly 10 years ago, and we licensed that as an SAAS to a number of different organisations across the country which provides us with a, an income stream independent of government. Um, it's got a highly uh, innovative and creative name. It's called MERP, Mambran Enterprise Resource Planning. Uh, and I was saying to my colleagues earlier that MERP has become a verb in my organisation. Everything has to get merped. You know, if you do some hours of work, it gets merped. And if you need to make a, a booking room request, it gets merped. Uh, we've conducted a digital audit um, across our organisation. Uh, we're um, building uh, multiple digital uh, platforms and at that point my marketing manager said when you're speaking this morning make sure you get a photo for your um, LinkedIn profile. So let me just bear with me one second. If your boss doesn't know you're here you might want to hide your face. Hang on. I do know how to use this phone. Here we go. So just uh, bear with me. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, but in all seriousness, I mentioned our marketing manager. Twelve months ago, I didn't have a marketing manager. And that's a salary plus on costs, uh, plus all of the other things that go along with that, um, that we were spending on clients 12 months ago. That's how the market is changing. Um, we're doing a branding exercise with an external branding company, so that logo um, that you see on the screen uh, is just about dead and buried. We'll be launching a new logo in the next uh, month or so, once it's been signed off on by our board. 
Uh, it might sound an obvious thing, but that notion of choice and control, customer centricity and so on, we've been doing lots of um, asking our customers what it is that they might like in the new world. And um, one of the things, using that Mambran Innovation Fund uh, concept, we're really focusing on a two-speed architecture. We're very conscious of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We are a strong organisation from a governance point of view, from a financial point of view, from a quality point of view, um, and customer loyalty is high. We don't want to jeopardise any of those things. So we've got our stable back office, uh, current service delivery running at one speed, and then we've got the Skunk Works, the innovations happening up here, uh, mainly customer f um, uh, the, the, the customer facing side where customer experience uh, is refreshed quickly, um, where those uh, requirements are often um, ever evolving. Uh, as I said, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So all of this talk about digital, digital uh, innovations and so on, it's actually a human thing. And I credit Steve Vamos, the former CEO of Microsoft Australia New Zealand and MD of Apple Asia Pacific, he was actually on both sides of the fence, which is quite interesting, uh, for the headline. And he's actually got a video, uh, a TED talk, It's a Human Thing is the title. I haven't put the link on the screen, but it wouldn't take long to find it by Google if you wanted to see it. Uh, and Steve Sammartino, I've mentioned a couple of times in his book, The Great Fragmentation, uh, and these are paraphrased quotes, I have to admit, said, the only strategy is to make something more interesting and make direct connections. It's emotional connections that matter most. Companies have to disrupt themselves and the offer is the thing that matters. When a brand has something significant on offer, something people care about, then they'll do the rest. So, what does that all mean for, for us at Mambrin? Well, we've um, got three broad areas of focus at a service delivery level. We're redefining the experience of disability and re-examining ways of organising supports. So we're trying to find ways of putting the person firmly in the centre uh, and in control. I'd have to say, uh, with a lot of pride actually, that there are many ex examples where we're already doing this really, really well. But it's not enough to pat ourselves on the back for the good work that we currently do. We need to turn up the concept of person-centred about a thousand degrees. The second area that we're focusing is embracing the customer and their carers. We need to understand that although the customer, I beg your pardon, the consumer is the primary customer, in our sector at least, other people in their circle will often participate um, in their support. Uh, and um, there's a concept uh, in marketing that talks about the influencer in terms of decision making and uh, often families in our sector uh, are the are strong influencers, if not the outright decision maker. So this is mainly about messaging. We need to get this right or we risk being overlooked by a significant portion of the market. And the third area is challenging current business models and hopefully you've already got a sense of that from what I've said so far already this morning. In order to effectively compete, we have to think about technology-enabled solutions where bricks and mortar become too expensive. I mentioned Higher Up before as one of the um, uh, the participant and worker matching services. I was in a, a NAB-sponsored conference about 12 months ago and a director of Higher Up, uh, Higher Up's board was speaking and he said, we will put bricks and mortar service providers out of business. It's almost their, their, uh, their goal. Uh, again, we're already doing so a lot in this area, but we need to do so much more. So what can we do? Well, uh, we need to realise that our competitive advantage is our staff. Uh, how and who we recruit, how we retain staff, and how we add value in, in our relationships is going to be critical to our, to our success. And we need to change established views of the skills required in prospective staff. David talked before about um, unqualified staff, and of course there are massive risks associated with uh, unqualified staff in certain circumstances. But in a consumer-driven marketplace, the best workers will have skills beyond the clinical. The certificate at three in disability won't be enough. Uh, we need people um, who are able to make uh, autonomous decisions, are able to act uh, uh, autonomously without supervision, are able to um, provide leadership uh, where none exists, and uh, to be robust, to res be resilient, and so on. 
and they also need to be supported by strong leaders who understand the pressure of changing role requirements. And again, here's this word disruption. We need to actively invest in disruptive models and within our budget capacity we're doing what we can in that area. Disruptive technologies, new capabilities, digitised processes or acquiring companies that have got those capabilities. So we've got massive runs on the board with that already with MERP, um, but we need to challenge ourselves uh, what's our next MERP. Uh, and I should say I credit the website newly.com.au for helping me bring together um, uh, uh, to crystallise some of the ideas that are in that slide. What we're already doing, I mentioned earlier that we're thinking about virtual reality. I've said to my general manager, information technology, that I want a living, breathing, practicing example of virtual reality on in daily use in our organisation in 18 months. Um, and his resignation was on my table later that day. No, in all seriousness, um, uh, he, um, he's excited by the idea and I must say, uh, I'm not a technology boffin, so I might even be confusing VR and AI. I actually don't care, uh, but I want that technology uh, really brought to the fore, thought about, challenge ourselves to think about how can we use this, uh, this new technology. And what I've said to him, um, hard KPIs aside, um, uh, that uh, even if we're not successful, uh, we'll have a lot of fun trying and we'll have learnt a lot in the process. I've got a, um, my HR manager leading a project, uh, actually the NDS is running, um, exploring autonomous teams and we're looking at, the, at ways that we can empower our staff uh, to act autonomously without reference to a manager. We're looking for opportunities uh, for growth um, and uh, it might not be growth as, as you traditionally expect. Um, of course we're going to consider gold nuggets that land in our lap, uh, but as much our growth strategy actually is as much about saying no. Uh, David's articulated quite clearly some of the price uh, issues in the NDIS, and we're not taking new participants that are loss makers. We're simply saying uh, we'll look after our own. We're certainly not going to cut services off to existing um, clientele while we can afford to, to do it. Uh, but uh, we're not willing to take on somebody else's problems. So uh, that means that we wait like that other, um, was it 65% that David mentioned that haven't come into the market at all? We're waiting till that price situation sorts itself out and some of the other business rules um, before we, we plunge into accepting new NDIS work. Uh, we're fashioning our message, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the branding exercise and so on. And we're rethinking HR. Um, so we've for example, we've entered a partnership with Sachs Consulting and uh, we've established a high performer model. So we've, we've done psychometric testing of our existing staff who we know anecdotally from the gut are great uh, disability support workers. And then we're using that as the, uh, the benchmark when we're recruiting. We, we actually psychometrically test every new, every potential hire. Um, well, sorry, you know what I mean. Not everyone who applies, but everyone who's about to be hired before we hire them uh, to make sure that they do actually fit within our own criteria for, um, uh, for a quality staff member. And we're finding projects, as I've mentioned a couple of times, for our innovation fund. So what might that look like? Well, we don't want to infect the existing market with mistakes, so that's that notion of the two-speed architecture. Uh, and we're looking to establish innovation uh, incubators and to some degree that HR uh, example that I just talked about is one of those. Um, we're looking for innovations with least resistance. Steve Sammartino talks about uh, w with the least number of no's, I actually prefer the most yeses. Uh, let's put it in the positive and say let's just get on with it. If we can say ask a series of questions and it's yes, 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 let's just do it. Um, Interestingly, uh, I think that if we can talk to the market about how we're doing innovation well, then the market will talk about us and then hopefully marketing will take care of itself. So uh, in my view, marketing in this um, current climate, and this is probably more true of general business, not just our sector, and innovation are actually synonymous um, in, the, in this new world that we're operating in. And I would actually add in their quality. I haven't talked a lot about um, quality, although hopefully it's been inferred from the things that I've said that we're not interested in a race to the bottom. 
Uh, we want to keep doing things as well as we possibly can uh, and as well as our customers expect us to do. Uh, so we think if we're getting quality right and we're continuing to innovate, then the marketing to some degree will take care of itself. So I mentioned at the start that the level that I was pitching the, um, uh, the presentation this morning, I've done very little talk about uh, price in terms of how it's affecting our business and how it's changing our operating models. I've, I've mentioned partnerships on, on the way through a little bit. Some of those other things there, a planning on that slide is in a participant planning sense, so planning actual supports for an individual participant rather than business planning. Uh, the processes is uh, the business planning side of things. Um, so I haven't actually talked about anything at that operational level at all. I guess um, uh, that's a topic for another day, but suffice to say, um, and I actually checked this on my calculator this morning that I wasn't exaggerating, uh, just in the last 12 months alone, I would say thousands of hours of management time have been putting into detailed planning at operational level. I've got a team of six, including myself, I did the maths, that's uh, on a 40 hour week, haha, <laughs> don't we wish we worked that. Um, I think it was 11,500 hours a year times six and I estimate that about 25% of our time minimum is spent preparing for the NDIS at the moment. So uh, what, who did the maths quickly, is that about 15,000 or something like that hours uh, in the last 12 months alone have been spent um, uh, planning for the NDIS. Am I okay for time? Good, so um, there are my contact details. Please feel free to uh, email me or ring me. Um, you can WhatsApp me, I haven't put it on the screen there, but you'll find me pretty quickly. LinkedIn, all of the other uh, social platforms, my marketing manager said I had to mention that. And um, if, uh, if you'd like to leave me your business card, if you've got any questions, um, just either scribble it on the back or just leave me a business card and I'll email you and we can talk. Um, if you'd prefer to do it that way. But if I can help at all, I will. And uh, thank you for your attention. And thank you. We'll take some questions. Oh, we've got time for questions. Damn, I thought if I talked long enough, I wouldn't get any questions. They'll ask you those really tricky questions. That's right, yes, yes, yes. So, um, Rosemary has got the microphone there. Um, any questions for Rowan? Yeah, I just wanted to get a microphone Uh, thanks for your chat, Rowan. Um, I'm still trying to form the question uh, just from some of the notes that I've taken. It's, it's some of the um, overarching sort of themes that have come out of it is, is, is the difficulty with the pricing currently with the NDIS and how that impacts um, training. Um, I couldn't help but sort of think back to the comment, uh, the, the chat from, um, from Apple made about emotional choices. And I would have thought this, this particular sector, especially with the the, if not the participants themselves, but those um, those significant influences, uh, influencers, are going to have um, primarily that uh, that emotional choice of um, uh, of picking the right uh, provider. Um, I, I just wonder aloud, I suppose, as to how the um, you know the the lack of training in in that sector um, is going to um, uh, going to impact your organisation. That, um, uh, that that you say now is uh, is investing um, in the HR and the uh, in the uh, psychometrical um, testing for um, uh, for potential employees. Is that a question or? Are I think I understand the question. Um, there's there's no question that uh, training is a massive issue, but it's 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 not in every circumstance. So the Kurt Firmleys of the world, um, people would be familiar with Kurt, he's a wheelchair uh, athlete, world, world championships and so on. Um, he actually doesn't give a stuff, pardon the French, what bit of paper you've got. Because he, he can articulate to you, I need you to turn the lights on, run the shower for me, it needs to be at this temperature, then I want to be got out of bed, etc. Uh, so he doesn't care whether you're qualified to do that stuff or not. He cares whether you do it well and he'll tell you whether he does it, you do it well. By the way, I don't know whether Kurt's even got an NDIS package. I just pick him as an example because he's a person with a disability that most people know. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've got people uh, that we support uh, who are basically mattress bound, who rely on other human beings uh, for every uh, human need. Uh, and they're unable to articulate in 
any way that you or I are used to, and my staff are expert at reading the signs, um, but it's really at a, you know, a pretty basic level that you know, the tepid water's the right temperature. If it's not, they may see a, a slightly downturned corner of the mouth or something like that. Um, so there's a whole spectrum is what I'm getting at, and training at the last group of people that I talked about is absolutely critical. The, the, um, to get it right, uh, in terms of uh, your knowledge and your experience and your competence. Uh, I should say, by the way, I use training in a very general sense that way. It's not just the piece of paper. It's, it's about all of the work that you've done to get you to that point in time, delivering that moment of service to that um, person in need becomes critical. But in the Kurt Fernleys of the world, it's not so important. So what we need to do is to find ways of focusing our training effort where it's needed and not wasting training effort uh, where it's not. So, um, you know, I'm just thinking of a case completely off the top of my head here. If we've got a group of participants who are very happy with um, uh, working with a couple of staff, the participants are relatively low needs, that, that's a bit of jargon from the sector, they just need someone to help them uh, to take them to the football or, or to you know, go to the theatre or whatever it might be to make sure they get on the right tram and get off at the right spot and don't talk to strangers, say, or, or pay the right money at the gate. Um, they have low health needs, so there might not even be a need for a first aid certificate. I mean, in metropolitan Melbourne, we're all seven minutes away from an ambulance arriving. Uh, so, um, you know, in that case, we might move to a situation where the person doesn't have a certificate of qualification, doesn't have annual first aid training, doesn't have CPR training, all that's related. Um, certainly doesn't need fire training because they're at the MCG. If there's a fire, the staff will take care of that. They'll just follow it. Do you see where I'm going with that? So training in that instance is, is not that critical. We haven't got there yet, I should say. All of our staff are qualified in all of those things. Um, but there will be a sector of our, uh, or a subsector of our community uh, where training is absolutely critical and there's not enough allowed in the price to do that well. So like classic not-for-profit mentality, we'll rob Peter to pay Paul. We'll make a surplus over here with the easy guys and then we'll spend it on the hard guys over here. That, that, that's the short answer, how, how we're going to do it. Mm. Mm. Um, just uh, sort of working through a scenario, um, and this is more reflective of uh, maybe a comment in regards to the whole industry, now, but maybe not your actual organisation. Um, if you have a, my understanding is that the NDIS actually determines the uh, the level of uh, services or care needed. Then they work with then the um, the uh, participant identifies a provider, and then they provide those services. Uh, mm -hmm. or they, they, um, so if the, if a provider actually provides services and negotiates to a level that is less than which they would normally have uh, required by means of training, and a liability uh, an incident arises and a liability uh, is attached to it. Is the liability, and the liability potentially arises because of the inadequate um, you know, level of qualification that that service typically would have actually required. Mm. Um, I'm questioning who's carrying the can. Um, is it the uh, provider or is the NDIS providing any level of, let's call it an ugly word indemnity, uh, in regards to um, being, they've actually defined and even accepted the level of services which have been provided? Mm. It's a great question. Um, the answer is uh, we'd be coming to our brokers to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> when some, uh, we're, we've, uh, we've had an incident and uh, we want to know whether we're covered. Uh, um, look, it, it, the last bit first, the NDIS will not provide any cover fire whatsoever in an incident. Uh, the you know, onus is completely on the service provider. Uh, we at currently are operating under the, in, I'm talking, this is a Victorian context or every jurisdiction it applies to. We're currently operating under the Victorian uh, standards and quality and safeguards mechanisms. So you may have heard of the Disability Services Commissioner, just as of yesterday, he had his powers expanded by the minister to conduct investigations and so on. Um, so uh, if there is an, and we're obliged to report to DHHS, Department of Health and Human Services, if there are incidents of certain categories. Um, and then the powers that be will form an opinion on whether our judgment 
about the level of qualification uh, was adequate or not. Um, and there's no black and white answer. So uh, we've had um, uh, challenges over time. It's a slightly different point to the training, but it, it, it speaks to the example, uh, the example speaks to the question, um, whether our ratio was adequate of, say, two staff to, to six participants in the community for argument's sake. And we've been challenged to explain what our ratio is. If you go to a school, they'll tell you that we have, you know, we never have a classroom more than 25 kids and, you know, whatever, whatever. Um, we actually don't have a specified number. I can tell you the average at an organisational level, you know, crudely how many service hours divided by how many staff hours. It's about three to one. Um, but at any one time, you might have a group with one staff member and ten participants in a room if they're doing some passive activity, sitting watching a, a video, for argument's <coughs> sake. Or you might have one on one or even two to one or even three to one if we're talking about one of those very high support needs people that I was referring to earlier. So there's no hard and fast rule and uh, it's only when you're able to get the chance to articulate the, 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 the reasons you made those decisions. Another example springs to mind is actually around um, uh, risk assessments. Um, our risk assessment is really only in a sense good for the place and person and time. So uh, if I'm a brand new worker to the sector and uh, there's a person with uh, behaviours of concern, that's jargon for um, generally uh, have behaviours that injure or potentially injure themselves or others. There are other categories of behaviours of concern, but let's use that as the example. Uh, I'm brand new to the sector. I have no experience with working uh, with behaviours of concern. Uh, and uh, if I were to be asked to take uh, that, uh, that client to the football on my own, I would probably be shitting myself. Um, and my risk assessment would be, you know, off the scale, don't do it. If you're a 20-year veteran who's worked with that person for the last 10 years and you know how to read the signs and you know how to de-escalate really quickly and to keep yourself safe, you might say, money for jam, I get to go to the footy, you know, and, uh, and I'm going to get paid to do it, how good's this gig, you know, and your risk assessment's going to be very low. To articulate that to a government bureaucrat when they say, what did your risk assessment tell you about uh, the decision that you made um, is, is actually a very hard thing to do. But those judgments are made through our sector all the time. Which staff with which participants, how many, uh, and it comes down to location. I mean, you can have um, an experienced staff member come up to a manager and hopefully in time under autonomous teams just make the call themselves and say, Bill's got off the bus this morning. I've got a funny feeling about this. I don't think he should go to, to, the, to the shopping centre. Uh, try writing that in a risk assessment, you know. <laughs> My gut tells me, I've worked with Bill a long time, something's happened at home or someone's bopped him on the bus or he's not happy. And I just, I just you know, so it's, uh, that's where the experienced uh, staff comes in and, and training and so on when you're dealing with people like that. So again, it's a bit of a similar answer to here. It, it's it's um, horses for courses, but no, NDIA will run for cover, the department will run... Oh, you know what the Department of Human Services do? You may well have experienced this already. Whenever there's a major incident, they'll conduct a quality of service review. And about uh, the first five questions in the quality of service review are all trying to get the service provider to say where they went wrong. Uh, it's not about quality of service for the participant, it's about how um, they can blame someone else uh, when they're writing their ministerial. In fact, I had a staff member go to a quality service review a little while ago. It was an allegation of abuse, not in our service actually, but it was reported to us, so we reported it. And uh, after an hour of the uh, Department of Human Services person saying, and who did you ring next and who did you notify and have you notified the police and all this sort of thing, um, the, uh, my staff member said, oh, and by the way, the client's okay, thank you. She's being cared for, you know. And the Department of Human Services person said, oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, how is she, you know. Um, <laughs> Bureaucrats—they have their job to do. We have ours to do. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough world. I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you. Wow! How do I follow that um, anecdote? But anyway, we shall. Um, so, uh, what we've basically uh, seen and heard this morning has been the challenges. Of the, I've just been told I have to bring the, the first time ever, I'm so loud, no one ever um, has a problem hearing me. 
Today's the first. Uh, so what we've, what we've heard about is a very complex system, a very welcome um, scheme, uh, but some enormous challenges for the sector um, and for your clients who are involved in that sector as providers. Um, so as we are specialists in those sectors, these, you, today is, is it very much about ensuring that we are responding and allowing you to uh, respond to support these organisations in managing some of those risks that we've heard, of, um, heard from this morning. Uh, what we're looking at now is, this is a graph of our, um, our claims experience over the last three years um, with a projection of where it will finish up in 2017. Uh, relating to the sector and um, employment practices liability claims. Now, what we've heard this morning, and you would have seen there, is that the, the challenges in workforce alone are enormous. Uh, you know, there are most organisations are dealing with three different unions. They have up to six different awards that they have to navigate. Uh, and it, it, is, it is no surprise that in 2015 we started seeing this escalation in employment practices liability claims. Uh, many of them were, were as a result of just not uh, following the correct processes um, and, and that was for not-for-profits or as David mentioned, um, uh, profit for purpose organisations, the last thing that they really want to focus on is some of the complexity of the, uh, the um, employment practices landscape. So once we saw this, um, this trending up in 2015, we started exploring uh, what, what, were some, what, what were the reasons behind this. Um, and, in, and while we were doing that and assisting some of our clients in that area, in 2016 it just continued to go through the roof. Um, during that time we established a partnership with a particular organisation to, to assist us to assist our end clients in reducing that. That organisation um, is a provider called EmployShore and over the last 12 months we've established a strategic partnership with them to assist us in bringing tools and supports uh, to those clients who are experiencing issues in the, in the space of managing their employment practices. So to talk about how EmployShore can help uh, your clients and um, we have with us today Julie Glynn who is the channel manager of EmployShore. She's been with EmployShore since September 2012, first as their um, business development manager and since April as a channel manager providing workplace relations solutions to SME business owners and HR managers. So please welcome me, um, in, or join me in welcoming Julie. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, to talk about what EmployShore can offer. We have a little video, I'm not sure which one, but it would be a surprise. Yeah.
have a plan. Understand your market. Understand what the break even point is, where your costs are going, all of that before you think of opening your doors. When you do open the doors, make sure that you know, stick to the plan. Just if you need to, but make sure that you understand that there is a journey that you're going to go on, there will be ups and downs, but trust in your plan. Ursula's not a paid actress, by the way. She's um, one of 14,000 clients now at uh, EmployShore. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with EmployShore, we came to Australia in 2012 and started with a very small startup team emulating a model from uh, the UK and the island. And now over the course of five years, we have 500 employees and as I said, 14,000 clients. And we have been known as, um, we're talking about Uber and disruptors in the industry, EmployShore has been known in the media to be a disruptor, to be the Uber, Uber of um, the workplace relations and the, the law firms of Australia. And we'll have a look at why a bit later in this presentation. It's predominantly because the model that we uh, provide small businesses across the country no longer relies upon um, hourly rates, which is quite interesting. To be able to provide full HR and full employment law services 24-7, unlimited, uncapped, um, without using hourly rates, is, it was really the, the right offering to the business community. So no surprises, it took off. So thank you, Dinah, for um, allowing us to come and speak with you all today because we have some uh, fantastic synergies in our business and in yours. You are trusted advisors in risk management, and so are we, but we focus on prevention. And talking about workplace relations and fair work is a huge topic. It normally takes us about two and a half hours to give an overview of it. So I'm going to try and condense that into perhaps 10 minutes. Good luck with that. But really I wanted to focus on employment practices because as I meet with insurance brokers, you talk to me about employment practices liability that you offer as an insurance policy to your clients. But what is employment practices liability? What is employment practices? It's the Fair Work Act. That's what it is. It's the Fair Work Act which is 800 odd sections of legislation it's 120 modern awards. Um, it is one of the most complicated workplace relations systems in the world, because if you've ever been to the UK or the US, you know that they don't have awards. Okay. And it's also um, state-based health and safety um, regulation, which is a whole other topic. So employment practices covers how you employ, how much you pay people, and how you manage people. And there is much governance and legislation holding every business owner accountable for that. So it's everything from recruitment, from the time a business posts an ad into the media for employees. <coughs> from that moment, a business will expose themselves to a potential claim an adverse action claim, which might be the ad was discriminatory. It's from that moment to your recruitment process. Was it um, a fair and just um, recruitment process? Was every candidate considered objectively? And how was that recruitment process handled? We have claims around that space. We have claims from employees who weren't even employees. And then it's from the onboarding right through to the management, the expectations on it, that employee performance management, right the way through to that very last exit interview and you're waving goodbye. So employment practices encompasses all of that. But if you're not dismissing people correctly and if there's any sort of discrimination in the workplace or unfair practices, if there's underpayments, if you haven't employed people correctly, you know, what happens if you get it wrong? This kind of happens. So these statistics, 
really demonstrate um, and validate the need for insurance, obviously. Okay. But before insurance, before that insurance claim, the business has suffered and it's suffered in a way that insurance can't cover. There's been brand damage, loss of productivity, someone, maybe two or three people have been on personal leave endlessly. Maybe the business has lost several clients. Whatever happened in that journey resulted in the employee being dismissed, which may then result <coughs> in being a business who has one of those applications in place with the commissioner or the ombudsman. So the commissioner handles unfair dismissals, constructive dismissals, and they also handle all the adverse action claims. And the ombudsman over there with 30,000 matters is purely um, listening to claims of underpayments. I mean, most business owners don't want to underpay, they just don't understand the award and it's so difficult to interpret. So how do we prevent? And that's what we focus on. I'm going to um, just perhaps walk you through Employ Shore's service model because this, these are the key ingredients to prevention. We know that businesses need three key things to prevent claims. They need a legal floor. They need to focus on good, robust contracts of employment and HR policies. Number two, they need processes. So the Fair Work Act, 800 odd sections, strictly governing and legislating the processes around managing and how you employ staff. Procedural fairness. You can have the right reason for dismissing an employee, tick, but you must have the right process too. And number three, as a business owner, are you documenting every step of the way. It's not what you said you did, it's what you can prove you did. So those are the three key ingredients to successfully employing people. Legal floor, process and proof. But most small business owners are focused on doing business. And that's why we had those statistics, because they haven't read the Act, and who would? Um, and they don't understand the processes and they sure as hell don't have time to document everything. And to give you an example, if I may, just um, an example that happened on Monday, so it's still fresh. One of my insurance broker uh, partners had referred a client to speak with me. He was on the, on the edge of dismissing uh, an employee who over three years had been very disruptive in the workforce. Um, verbal, ab verbal abuse, the throwing around of tools, uh, lots of absent, absent uh, days. Um, and it had got to the point where the rest of the team don't want to work with him anymore. He's been stood down and it, the pressure is on him as a director not to allow him back to the workforce. So he's calling his broker to see what his policy looks like because he knows this is going to be at least an application. Um, he had a really good reason. There's, there was strong suspicion around drugs and alcohol abuse. Um, there was bullying and verbal abuse in the workplace. So the reasons were all very solid. But then I'm asking him, well, if we had to represent you in court, what have we got to take with us in documentation and process? I don't have anything, Julie. So unfortunately, we don't get to dismiss that employee today. We now need to slow it down and go back and he needs to suffer it until we've got the process in place. We've followed the right procedure and we actually have the legal floor to do drug and alcohol testing and document that the employee agreed it would constitute as instant dismissal. So not having that framework in place means he can't take action when he really needed to. We just had to slow it down. And it does only cost $65 for an employee to lodge a claim, okay? So that's why with, this is the uh, employee shore model. So it's no surprise it starts with having a consultant sit with a business owner and go through compliance, go through their framework, go through their documentation. And where it's lacking, we pick it up and create it. We provide 24-7 advice 
that's HR support on some days and it's employment law advice on the other days. Okay. This is a way of a small business, or any business up to 500 employees, literally outsourcing employment law and HR services. Okay. But even if you get everything right, for $65 an employee can still ask the umpire to uh, have a look at who's, who was right and who was wrong which is why we need representation and we need insurance as well. So it's that seamless service which provides absolute indemnity to a business owner that no matter what, there's no costs associated with any employee disruption at all. And that was the model that disrupted Australia's legal firms and HR consultancy as we know it. It's completely seamless. Uh, ANSFAR, for for ANSFAR clients that you have, ANSFAR will provide the EPL insurance in there. And it's quite seamless. It's the client is coming to us for documentation, coming to us for advice. If anything goes pear-shaped, we're doing the representation and ANSFAR are filling in with the insurance if we just cannot successfully defend them. For non-ANSFAR clients, there is insurance already in that, policy, in that uh, membership. And we can talk about that. Um, so just moving forward, talking about prevention. This is an exciting campaign that we're really proud to work with ANSFAR on in an effort to help business owners recognise where the risks are in their business and to overcome the objection of, no, I'm right, thanks. I've got, I've got some contracts here. I've got a letter of offer and I've got my work health and safety policies, I'm all good. Rather than wait till it has to be tested, we're presenting this audit, and this is consultancy, um, our team, consultancy. Ordinarily we charge $1,250 for this consultancy, for this audit, but for your clients, it's at no cost. And this gives them the opportunity, before a claim, before anything goes pear-shaped, to know where their business improvements lay. So starting up the top with a safe check, it's having one of our consultants go out on site, dust off their work health and safety policies, have a look through them and see if they're currently compliant as, as in 2017 compliant. Having a walk through their site to see if there's any gaps in their safety practices. Drafting a report showing the, the issues identified and the solutions. Wage check. This is where here <coughs> at EmployShore we have probably um, a third of our claims are to do with underpayment of wages. Okay, so let's have a look at it. You may have heard in the uh, media at the moment that uh, penalty rates are under review in some industry sectors, so restaurants, cafes. As of July the 1st, their penalty rates started to change. So this is a good time to ask them, do you want a wage check? So we have a look. Okay. So we can have a look at what they're currently paying and how it measures up with the award and is there a difference. And a contract review, this is where they get to say, well, here's a copy of the contract that we have. We send that to our legal team and they provide a, pro a report that says, this clause is or isn't compliant or here's where you're leaving a gap wide open for yourself and an employee could walk through there and make you liable for X, Y and Z. For example, um, we have a client just recently who was paying $5 above the hourly rate of the award and that was including all of the allowances such as 17.5% loading. But it wasn't documented. There was no offset clause in their employment contracts. So when the unions advised the employee, they told the employee that they would be eligible to make an underpayment of wages claim for the loading because there was no offset clause in the contract. And that's up to the last six years. Then you times that by all the other employees who, yeah. Okay, so this is what we're looking at. It doesn't mean it's necessarily non-compliant. It means that you're leaving yourself open. So with that um, business health check, um, like I said, it's complementary to your clients. It's a, you can position it as um, 
you know, a really useful tool to talk about liabilities, particularly if they're a bit reluctant to admit there's liabilities. Um, it's a good business building activity. There are incentives around it as well. Okay. So my colleague down the back there, Shannon Wells, he um, is our local Victor uh, Victorian <laughs> business development manager for EmployShore. And both Shannon and I are going to be hanging around, um, willing to answer all your questions about the business health check, how you can implement it, how it all works, um, and how you can position it with your clients. And like I said, it's at no cost. So we'd be happy to talk. Thank you, Diana. Thanks, Julie, for that. So if you've got some ANSVAR clients that you think uh, the health check could be useful for, speak to your client solutions uh, representative who should be here in the room and we can certainly follow up with that. Uh, so join me in thanking Julie for her... <laughs> So in addition to, uh, to the employment liability, uh, you would have heard this morning that uh, the, the ability for disability sector and in fact all care sectors to have invested in uh, digital technologies, IT infrastructure of any sort it has been very limited um, and, it, and it continues to be so uh, going forward with the, the challenges in the pricing models or the efficient pricing models that are used. Uh, so we've identified this and for the, over, the, over the last period or, or since Victoria has actually been um, uh, involved in the NDIS trials, we've recognised at ANSFAR that our clients need, need to be able to access some really critical systems to the delivery of any type of care service. Um, and they need to do that in a digital environment that, that um, doesn't involve enormous um, upfront investment. So we've been working with an organisation uh, uh, called um, Rapid Global, who we identified through a 12-month process <clears throat> as having a state-of-the-art platform um, and some state-of-the-art content that was put, going to be absolutely critical to our um, disability and other care sector providers to produce a number of modules. So in that, over the last period of time, we have been working with them to develop these modules and develop these um, IT tools that are going to be critical to the success of our, our clients. So what I'd like to do now is introduce Neil Ditton, who is the Business Development Manager at Rapid Global, and he's been there since April 2013, um, and he works in working with clients in their workforce management requirements. So he's going to take you through a speed dating version of, of the functionality of the tools that are going to be available um, to ANSFAR clients. Um, so please welcome Neil. Very good, thank you, Diana, and uh, yes, welcome to everyone. Uh, before I get started and go into talking a little bit about uh, what the offer is here uh, with Rapid Global, uh, I wanted to just take you through a short video which talks about um, uh, yeah, what we, uh, our capabilities are and what we offer to uh, some of these clients as well. Some of the world's most respected and successful organisations take advantage of workplace health and safety and workforce management intelligence through rapid global software solutions. Rapid's end-to-end -end solutions fast track productivity and maximise turnover across the most diverse range of commercial, industrial and service industries. A rapid global software partnership provides customised and improved workplace performance for seamless contractor management as well as legal and safety compliance with Rapid Global's integrated safety solutions. Rapid Global clients rely on us to increase efficiencies, so our focus is on providing practical system solutions to lift productivity and to lower operating costs. Specialised software and business experience allows integration with a client's existing systems to improve efficiencies in a number of key areas. The Rapid Conduct and Rapid Contractor Management resources ensure contractor compliance, and most importantly, safety optimization, ultimately leading to increased productivity. 
Rapid Global's access systems permit to work and visitor access software technology saves time, money and staff resources. Our systems cross-check and monitor access and workplace standards requirements. Preventative monitoring and reporting procedures through Rapid Global's service alert, incident reporting and hazard management technology provide safety and accountability throughout daily operations, leading you to focus on your core business strengths. Rapid's practical and proactive solutions provide risk management tools to oversee compliance of contractors, as well as meeting corporate health and safety regulations and site-specific requirements. Rapid Global Software's award-winning excellence makes your business world look more efficient with software that helps you get on with the job. So that's a uh, yeah, great little overview there which talks about uh, our range of solutions and what we can do and do provide to a lot of clients in different industries. Um, just a few little stats there around Rapid and who we are. So basically we're a, a workplace health and safety uh, software firm um, based in Adelaide that uh, provide a range of workplace health and safety solutions to help clients um, yeah, manage their uh, compliance and due diligence. Uh, and also offer through that uh, a way in which to be able to yeah, reduce some, uh, some overheads there as well. Uh, look, lots of different clients and lots of different industries. Um, when we look at things like our users in the system, we've got over yeah, one and a half million users in our induction system alone. Um, it talked about just any awards along the way. Uh, just last year, the Australian Business Awards, uh, we picked up uh, four awards around the way we've evolved our access systems. Uh, so that as your clients get people coming into their sites, that they can actually can track and, and confirm the compliance of people entering the sites to make sure that only compliant workers are entering. Um, in addition to that, uh, half of our uh, employee workforce is actually a client services team. So that's support that we offer through a 1-800 number, an email support address uh, to both your client, but also the end users. So if you have a contractor or an employee that's got any questions or queries about how to use the systems, they can give us a call as well. And we've done some case studies and released newsletters uh, which talk about the way we constantly evolve our pro uh, products and processes uh, to try and stay ahead of the curve there as well. So uh, as it went through that video there, it talked about a range of different solutions and these are uh, a full suite of solutions including some apps as well that we've heard today um, you're starting to need to look at innovating towards to be able to make those desktop tools available uh, to drive some efficiency so that people can be more mobile. So today I'll just be focusing on three of these solutions particularly around the inductions, our rapid induct, rapid incident reporting and also our rapid service alert which combines our auditing module too. So why do we do what we do? Um, we know that something like 330 people are injured every day that require more than you know, a week off work. Um, that's an alarming stat, and that's obviously, again, leads to, or talks to what we heard earlier around the fact that there's productivity, people are off work, you've got to backfill people in positions, and so what's the better way to manage that? So what we know is that yeah, with training, um, uh, implementing yeah, great corrective actions, uh, choosing reputable suppliers if you are engaging contracting companies, all of that helps make a difference. And we know it does make a difference. We've heard uh, client after client with Rapid uh, using different modules in different ways uh, to be able to help you know, mitigate their risks and achieve a measure of compliance as well. So each of these uh, uh, clients in different industries um, yeah, take different parts of their modules, use it slightly differently. It's very customizable and configurable uh, to be able to yeah, drive those efficiencies there as well. So what I'm going to do to, uh, to, uh, to start with is just uh, focus on just one of those case studies and that's the last one here around Catholic safety, health and welfare uh, because they in fact actually use three of these modules that we're talking about today and we'll learn a little bit about you know, how they're doing that and what they're doing around um, compliance. So Catholic Safety, Health and Welfare, the um, Workplace Health and Safety Support and Advisory Unit to ensure that uh, the, the unit itself uh, and the Catholic organisation within South Australia uh, meets their obligations and conformance around self-insurance. So although that self-insurance, which is different to you know, the insurance that you guys provide as brokers, uh, the, 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 issue, the message is basically the same. You still need to have systems in place uh, to be able to you know, make sure that you're compliant. So the challenge for these guys was that uh, they had yeah, quite a lot of workers, uh, a number of volunteers across very diverse different um, uh, sites as well and they needed to be able to make sure that those people were reached and have a way in which they can be trained. Uh, incidents can be managed as well and in particular around contractor inductions. 
because for them, contractor inductions and in fact having people or induction contractors come to site to be inducted was just not viable. You have an inconsistent message being delivered uh, to contractors depending on the person who's delivering the training on the day. Uh, there's contractors who go, look, I'm coming to your site for induction training. It's my time. I'm going to charge you for that. So they had to find another way to help you know, drive efficiency and make it a bit quicker as well. So the solution for these guys was, yes, let's organise to get uh, three different modules with RAPID. So the RAPID uh, incident reporting uh, provided uh, a lot of uh, visibility for the management team to see how are incidents being managed, um, are the corrective actions happening to make sure that those incidents are actually being um, sorted out and resolved, and uh, a management team or key stakeholders being advised that these incidents are even taking place. Uh, so they were able to achieve that uh, yeah, with incident reporting. Rapid induct, uh, the ability there to be able to deliver those inductions online but off site. So that way, then contractors uh, or employees, or whoever it is, are able to complete their online learning um, in an environment at home, in their pajamas, with a beer, doing whatever they want to do. At least when they come to site the next day to start doing work, they're inducted and ready to go. And the service alert um, is the uh, system there to help them with regard to their auditing requirements, especially around their assets, to make sure that there's, from a continuous improvement point of view, that their assets are being managed and, and um, maintained properly. Uh, yeah, so the results for them uh, was fa were fantastic. Um, yeah, as I said before, they, held, they had the uh, monitoring of non-conformances, uh, uh, notifications were being sent, um, and also regular routine reminders for repetitive audit tasks were being generated as well. So yeah, with um, so Cathy there, who's my contact within Catholic Safety, Health and Welfare, um, yeah, very happy, and also in discussions with us to talk about other solutions that we can provide her as well. So let's have a look at each of these solutions that we talked about just then with that case study, uh, and tell you a little bit more about what they do. So the overall induction process is that let's be able to create some courses in the system, have a delivery mechanism so that people can be trained off site. Uh, if you want to be able to capture things like in uh, police clearances and certificates, things like that, it has that ability in the system as well. So what we've heard uh, from, to, from speakers today is that there, there's different training requirements for different types of people. Uh, based on the site or the, or the person who needs to be trained, um, what sort of training do they need? Is it online training? Is it, can they complete online forms? Can they go to do some face-to-face -face training somewhere else and record some results? So we have the ability to be able to track that in the system. And with the matrix or, or uh, training analysis in the system, be able to set and make sure that the right people are being trained in the right competencies. Uh, clients are able to see visibility of all their people in the system as well. So it'll tell them who's compliant, who's not, at a glance with the uh, dashboards in the system. But the real power here is being able to provide each individual person with a portal in which they can self-manage a lot of this themselves. If there's courses that they need to complete online, great, they can complete those um, through uh, their desktop or through an app, which I'll explain. If they need to be able to upload individual tickets and licenses and clearances and police things and stuff like that, they can actually upload and provide those as well. So whilst the system has the ability for our clients, or your look like, to be able to create and edit their own courses and training, Antvar has actually worked towards being able to create some pre-written courses and uh, e-learning as well. So there's a number of courses that will be on offer uh, for your yeah, clients to be able to use within the system as well to be able to deliver their training. Um, if I cite the Julie's case here earlier, things like um, in, in that example, was, was the employee uh, being, uh, were they given bullying and harassment training? Were they given uh, drug and alcohol training? Um, what did that look like? What are the mechanisms in place when an auditor does step in or someone comes in and says, show me how you're managing these things, show me the evidence or the proof that, these, that this person was inducted, that you did your due diligence, this is where we can assist with this. So with a range of these different courses, both employee courses and also contractor courses, you can help make sure that you know, people are actually um, yeah, being trained on these things as well. So these are all on offer within our system as well. Okay, there's quite a few courses there, there's about 14, so let me, let me go through that. <laughs> Alright, so as we know, more and more people are starting to use mobiles more. Um, the systems to be able to be more mobile, for people to be able to access their desktop functionality uh, needs to be uh, used in the system. So we do have a range of apps. Uh, the Rapid Global app is an app that you, uh, that clients can use to be able to you know, manage and do spot audits and, and uh, check on compliance of people. 
and the rapid induct app also allows individual users to be able to complete their inductions on an app as well and, and do that full desktop functionality that I talked about before. We'll also be offering clients uh, what we call an ANSVAR member portal or a client portal. This is where clients then have the ability to be able to go in and self-manage their, their training and their e-learning that they need to do to pass on to their people. So that's the induction side. Incident reporting, a little bit different. This one here is around, yes, let's have a system in place where we can move away from that paper incident form to be able to log incidents online, uh, for uh, key stakeholders to be notified that there's an incident that's happened, but also the ability to investigate and assign actions so that you know, the hazard or the incident, whatever's occurred, doesn't happen again. So within the system, it is fully customizable in terms of things like incident types, uh, mechanism of injuries, um, that sort of thing as well. Um, notifications are sent to people based on different parameters. Uh, the investigation stage allows people you know, who are part of the investigation team to upload their findings and assign corrective actions as well. And when those people have corrective actions, they're able to actually complete those actions in the system or through a series of progress notes. Uh, there's intuitive reporting that's in the system as well that's available to clients so they can actually you know, see how they're tracking with regard to their incident management. And again, within that rapid global app, the one app there provides power to the end user to say, okay, I want to be able to check on the inductions of my people and now in the same app I can also report a quick incident. Okay, so service alert. Service alert is the system which encompasses our rapid auditor product as well. So for a lot of our clients are using this for preventative maintenance on assets. So if you've got some assets, and, and for aged care clients that might be the racks themselves uh, or, or buildings, you can actually list them in the system and say, let's have a series of audits or checks that need to be done and routinely given to people so they can actually go through and you know, manage and make sure that you know, the auditing has been done and that that particular site is compliance. Um, so yes, yeah, so you, you can load assets and that could be different things, from buildings to fire extinguishers to other things as well. Uh, the system provides the ability to be able to do um, repetitive tasks, so it's kind of set and forget. Let's put some uh, audits in the system and be able to assign those audits to people to be able to complete. Within the system is an audit form builder, so depending on what your audit forms look like, you can build them in different ways. We've got different clients using it for things like pre-start checklists when operating machinery, uh, for auditing for you know, other sites as well. And a dashboard here also provides visibility to say, well, where, what is the status of my audits? Which audits are due, which ones overdue, which ones are scheduled for people to complete, and I should be able to see what those are, and also the, uh, the audits coming up as well. Notifications, like all of our systems, uh, are sent out via email, so people do get notifications for, uh, for upcoming audits they need to do, but any overdue notifications as well. And again, back on that app, the ability there to be able to complete audits uh, with some other functions there soon to come too. So we're pleased that our, Diana's actually approached us with this because um, as you've seen with some of the case studies, we already do this sort of stuff now with a lot of different clients, especially in the same sort of sectors industry that, that Ansvar operate in. So what we've arrived at is a couple of models that we'd like to offer for yeah, Ansvar clients or members. So Ansvar model one is geared more towards the small to medium clients, so perhaps some of those childcare centres that maybe have you know, a handful of our staff. That, that couldn't probably afford or, or know even how to set up a system with things like what are the training requirements uh, for my staff, what are the incident types that I need to capture in terms of managing the incidents for my childcare centre. Let's have them set up in a system which is pre-configured, templated, ready to go. They can simply get, a, get themselves a user ID, log in and start to be able to effectively deliver training to their staff, manage incidents, um, do their auditing on their assets and things as well. And as we said there on the, on the slide, that's complimentary for the first 12 months, so there's no cost there with that. For some of the medium or large enterprise clients, uh, they may choose to um, have some discounted uh, pricing, but, but still have the uh, flexibility to be able to configure and tailor the system to what their unique requirements are as well. So that's something that we'll be offering as model two there. So I'm not sure how we're going for time, but um, I think that concludes. Does anyone have any queries or questions? Otherwise, if you do, outside there, you will have noticed as you walked in, I've got a great big banner and stand over there on, on the right-hand side. Um, so please feel free to talk to me. Um, take some brochures as well, some of my cards. And if you've got some of your clients that are interested in these solutions, I'm happy to talk to them further. Thank you.
So thanks, Neil. It's been great. We've been working together, as I mentioned earlier, for 12 months, and with the fully configured um, system that we've worked uh, with Rapid Global, what we've actually brought is our expertise and understanding of the particular needs of all of the sectors uh, so that we're able to pre-configure all of the modules so that those small to medium customers, whether it be childcare, disability care um, or aged care, any of those areas that involve uh, the need to um, have those types of systems, we have a pre-configured package that takes into account what we know they need and what is the language that they're used to dealing with in there. So, so that, that makes it very easy for them to move on to those digital platforms um, and to have all of that data for their reporting and better manage those risks associated uh, with, with those particular activities. So that is just part of the work that we do in terms of building risk, um, risk solutions for our clients and building a product offering that allows you as the brokers to go in and have a um, complementary advice around uh, what, what are the risk management needs of that client. And so where does that you know, where does that come from and why is that broader than the disability service? I just thought in, in finishing off in terms of um, NDIS for today, I thought I'd just give you some perspective on what the size of the NDIS market is in comparison to, to others. And if what you see there on the um, screen is that on full rollout, NDIS will actually be uh, around $24 billion uh, worth of um, government expenditure um, in there. And that, that does not include any associated disability support pension uh, funding. So if you have a look at that and then you look at something like Medicare, which we're all familiar with um, and we all understand the costing model and we pay our levy and the state governments also contribute and co-ex spend half their time every time they have a meeting arguing about the cost shifting between states and um, and the Commonwealth. Uh, won't be the case with NDIS, although David did indicate that there might still be some issues there. But if you look at the size of Medicare and the si size of the PBS, you can see that um, the NDIS is a very, very significant area of government expenditure. Um, and as we're all taxpayers here, that's, um, that's part of where that's going to. Um, and, in, and in fact, it is larger and, and, and will continue to be larger, even with the growth, um, in the funding, the government funding of aged care. So as you can see across there, the sectors that we deal with being both NDIS, aged care, disability, um, and, uh, and some parts of the Medicare system, uh, uh, we're touching all of those. All of those are um, included there. What's not included there, of course, is around um, also the expenditure on childcare, which is another area of government funding that, uh, or, or government services that we're um, involved with. All of these sectors, however, are challenged by these three key areas, which all of our speakers have touched on today. We certainly covered off digital disruption, and, and we should all now be acutely aware of um, the impacts of, um, of a digitised marketplace uh, for the disability sector and the challenges um, of the providers in that sector in being able to adapt um, to that. Uh, particularly with the uh, challenges in the pricing model. We've also looked at um, the, the consumer-directed care model uh, for disability, where the money is attached to the participant or the person receiving the services and is no longer attached to the provider. Uh, so that changes everything um, and brings in all of those elements around marketing, um, et cetera, that, uh, uh, that we've spoken about. Um, Consumer-directed care is also the case with, uh, with childcare and with aged care. You're probably all aware of the reforms that have been occurring in aged care, that the money once again is attached to the participant and they can move around and have a lot more flexibility. The other significant um, area of reform across all of these sectors that we have only briefly mentioned, and that is around national accreditation and quality standards. 
We talked to the disability standards um, coming in and, and their impact on safeguarding people and preventing harm, but they're also significant in terms of the uh, licence to operate or the ability to be a licensed operator, whether that be in childcare, aged care and soon to be disability care. So they are very significant. They are going to drive um, the in, in most cases, how the operations are set, what their compliance um, arrangements need to be, um, and what is the regulatory environment in which they operate. Um, so so those three areas are the three areas that we're hoping that you, when you're um, providing advice to your clients, that, that you need to be aware across all those three areas about how they're impacting on their business um, and what are their needs in terms of managing not just the simplicity of the, you know, do I comply, am I meeting my regulatory requirements, but also um, are they able to operate and provide the quality of care? Because if, they, if they're not providing the quality of care, their clients will know about it. And that is through um, the choice and t transparency principles of, of consumer-directed care. What we have here, um, most of them you'll be quite familiar with. We've all heard of the My School, My School site, where now you can get performance of, um, of any particular education provider. And uh, you can go on and see how they're performing against the um, standards. The uh, My Aged Care um, site is also where you can go in there and against the, um, the four national standards um, in aged care. There are a lot of substandards to that. You can then go in and look at any provider that you're considering um, uh, uh, utilising. How are they performing against the quality standards? What is their rating um, uh, in terms of all of the uh, key outcome measures that make up those standards? Uh, with, We've also got um, the same in My Child site. Every childcare centre now, we have the consumer or the person who is buying the services now has full transparency, transparency down to an individual site. This changes everything when you're working in a consumer um, choice model. So the, these providers out there, the, your clients out there, these are all areas that they are grappling with and, and they need our support. And our risk solutions strategies, of which we've touched on some, uh, are about helping them to do that. So I just thought I'd just do a quick run through of what the disability sector quality standards would look like. They'll be broken into three areas, develop, um, developmental, uh, preventative and corrective. Um, as good risk managers, we always want to be in the preventative space in terms of operational risk management. Um, and that is very much around uh, what are the safeguards for the individuals there, how do we cause no harm, um, how do we know that the, the types of services they're providing are what they expected? Uh, so there's a whole, and, and in most particularly, um, there are specific um, requirements around restrictive practices. Now, restrictive practices um, are, are sometimes required um, to prevent harm, but there is a lot of controversy about how they're provided. <clears throat> so there are specific standards there. It's something that we as the insurance industry need to be right across, making sure that people know what they are, um, because there will be uh, quite a lot of focus in any sort of accreditation audits on how they go about providing um, any restrictive practices and whether they've followed the correct protocols. And when we talk restrictive practices, we're not only talking physical constraints, we're also talking chemical or pharmaceutical constraints. So um, medication management and things like that for, uh, for disability services um, is, is very high on the agenda. So in terms of... Um, what the uh, there was a consultation report that that has resulted in, as David um, mentioned, a commissioner being appointed um, and being given um, powers. The the consultation report was very clear about the staff screening options that uh, were, that that employers are expected to um, to maintain, uh, and they are responsible for the risk 
the risk management. Um, as a minimum, there are referee checks. Um, and when we say referee checks, that's not just ringing up one or two people. They've, they've actually got, they actually have to, um, to be really effective, look at um, up to three, and they have to explore in detail any, um, any gaps in uh, employment periods. So, so there, there is a high expectation that that is given a lot of attention. I might also point out that that's also something that's come out of the um, Royal Commission into Institutional um, Abuse of Children, are uh, also saying that they are going to, they're recommending a lot stronger standards around that. Um, so there is also, uh, there has also been created a bad persons list. So this is people who have um, been subjected to or, or have been, uh, had received a number of complaints of behaviours of concern. So this could be an, an employee, um, but it doesn't meet, doesn't meet the reporting criteria or the, or the criminal sanction criteria. So each state is now maintaining a bad persons list across aged care and disability care. Some of you might al already be aware that that exists. Um, and uh, it is incumbent that, uh, that all um, employers refer to that list when employing people working in this area. So you can see there's, some, there's going to be a lot of work for employers in, in this area. Some of the others that they talked about, well, what, what would be the options for complaint handling? And here we'll talk, um, they, they said, they mentioned that self-regulation might be, pot, be on the cards. Um, but that's not the case. We know, now know that we will have a complaints commissioner um, and that will be conducted by an independent statutory organisation. So going back to what happens if you get a complaint um, and you have to put a case through to the commissioner, how have you documented that? Um, how have you managed that? What was the investigative action that you took there? Did you have proper process? Um, all of those issues, you're going to be asked not only from an employment practices point of view, but also from a complaints commissioner, whether that be aged care, child care or disability care. So if you think back to the incident reporting modules um, that, that um, we have developed with the help of Rapid Global, and you think of the induction packages and the types of preset programs, we included in there a code of conduct, um, and all of those key areas that you can, uh, your clients will be able to use to establish that they have the right mechanisms in place um, to respond to those types of activities. And remembering when, I go, when we talk about transparency, if they haven't done that, then it will actually um, be available uh, um, and transparent to their consumers and their future market um, that they're not that great with, with those sorts of things. The child care standards, um, same principles, uh, children's health and safety, the physical environment, all of those areas are covered under the standards and every single child care centre um, is, is rated on where they, you know, if they need improvement there. Um, if there's significant improvements required and they don't actually resolve it within specified periods of time, they, they lose their licence. So the child care standards and quality is, um, requirements are much, much more than just a nice to have. They will be fundamental to these people being able to manage their businesses. And, I'll just, and aged care is exactly the same regime. So the question is now, so how is ANSFAR <coughs> responding? Um, we've, we've showcased um, and you, with you today some of the tools that we have had under development over the last 12 months to assist our clients um, and um, I just want to take you through how they how they're going how to apply those the one thing that and I know when Warren was mentioning you know what's social policy risk and uh, you know what is that well this sort of um, explains what that is Managing risk in, a, in the financial context, and we're all from um, you know, financial services, it's pretty easy. You either can cope with that loss and you can bring it down to a financial dollar or, or, or you can't. Um, and you can either bear that risk or you can't. And as an organisation, you can all reach agreement 
on what, what the level of risk and what your risk appetite is. So that's a, that's a pretty easy concept that we deal with in uh, business and commerce uh, fairly regularly. But once you get into the, uh, once you start dealing with um, human services, it just gets highly complex. We all have a different view about what our risk appetite is. Um, and, and we need to actually balance that between the needs of the organisation and the business, the needs of the community, and the dignity of risk of individuals. And this is particularly important for disability um, in that uh, when you think about what the objective of the NDIS is, is that those people can participate in the community and in life to the best of their ability and to be able to choose how they do that. That's something that able-bodied people take for granted, but people with a disability or the aged or infirm, their dignity of risk is often compromised by the needs of others or the needs of business organisations. They don't quite get that choice. Then, even within, and I use the example here of childcare, every decision you make on a policy, so you have your safeguarding policy, what's appropriate um, contact between a child and a carer? Now, as an insurer, we would like to have a nice rule that no one's ever alone with a child and uh, no one ever touches them for any reason. Would that be pretty fair, Darren? That'd make you happy. Um, unfortunately, uh, that can't be the case, as we well know, because nurturing healthy relationships, which is the purpose of early, early childhood education, um, and building the confidence in that child so that they can learn, um, and you want to build their skill. We know, we know you have to sort of um, climb a tree a couple of times and fall out once before you actually master the art. So there is some, some harm there. So that is the difference between ANSVAR's approach to risk <laughs> solutions um, and anyone involved in delivering service, risk services and risk advice to our sectors, you need to understand the discussion of risk is complex. There is, no, there is a lot more grey, um, so we have to help people to balance that. So how do we do that? Um, what we basically do is we take, we tend to take, we, we take an approach to supporting our people not only in the areas of operational risk, but also in all of the mechanisms that they use to manage risk across their organisation. Traditionally, insurers will <coughs> simply provide some tools and resources around risk control in the areas of insurable risk that they're interested in. Um, and that's okay, uh, but what we know is translating that into a human services environment um, is very difficult given that balance of risk and the inherent unpredictability of people, particularly little people, um, which uh, is an area that we have a lot of exposure to. Uh, so what we need to do is what are the systematic um, areas how do we support that organisation to be good at managing risk regardless of, of what, how the risk presents? So what we look at here is, we call this the, the governance house or the risk management house, all of these elements. Governance is the underpins everything, that's our foundation. If you can get really good risk governance happening in your organisation, and this applies for yours as well as for your clients, um, then you have a whole heap of systems or tools or pillars that help you achieve that. Risk control is just one of them. We help with the enterprise risk in terms of what are the strategic risks, um, how does that affect their purpose, and remember that we're, to coin David's term, we're, we're working with organisations largely uh, are, are profit for purpose. Um, organisations, so their achievement of their purpose is very fundamental to their existence. Given the accreditation and quality environment, they, these organisations all require a comprehensive quality and compliance regime. You've seen in the costings in this area, there's not a lot of money for infrastructure there, so that's where we're looking at providing digital solutions. Um, right across the quality, continuous improvement and compliance and accreditation. All of those things contribute to organisational performance. At ANSVAR, we take the whole of client and the whole of insured and the whole of organisation approach to how we develop risk solutions so that, so that we not only just uh, we provide the whole solution and give them an understanding of how they can, through their leadership and their governance, 
ensure that that gets into place. The other difference um, in, in our approach to risk management support is that we, we work with the maturity of the organisation. Um, and I see some clients in the room where we've had this discussion about where do you think you are in your um, risk management journey, for want of a better word? How mature is your organisation in being able to take these risk, um, risk tools and embed them across your organisation? Because there's no point jumping right ahead if you've got some fundamentals to, um, to get in place first. So that's where we might help with some uh, you know, if someone's in the developing stage where they really haven't got their risk management framework in, um, in place, uh, we work with them on the framework and then we start helping them to go and embed some of those risk controls throughout the organisation. So what, are, what is the ANSFAR risk management services suite? Well, it's made up of a number of areas. We've, uh, we certainly produce the risk control toolkits and they're, and they're all there and, and um, available to you and we're continually developing them um, around specific operational risk. Now that could be to do with safeguarding or it could be fire management or any aspect of risk that, that we're involved with. Um, we also provide, as I mentioned, the ERM support. Um, and more and more um, in our sectors, because the need is, so, is there, we've moved into um, providing systems and sector specific software platforms of which you've seen today, the three uh, modules through Rapid Global that um, we've worked with them to develop for the sector around incident reporting, um, uh, induction and uh, train staff training and our, our um, service and maintenance auditing uh, module. We also offer um, strategic supplier partnerships and I'm going to talk, and we've talked about EmployShore. You've seen that we've established um, a relationship with EmployShore so that we, we are able to do some of the hard work for you and your clients in terms of tracking down where, where is the most cost effective, best um, services that they can tap into. Um, that we can see here in Australia and EmployShore is an example of that and I'll talk about another one in a moment. Uh, we also, under our um, enterprise risk management, work in the strategic risk workshop space. So we work with boards um, of our insureds uh, to help them understand what is their strategic risk profile and we've actually run a number of NDIS um, uh, workshops with some of our disability service providers. Um, who, with their boards, to help them um, understand some of the discussions they need to have that Rowan took you through earlier today. And of course, we have our site risk survey and some insured assessment program. Um, and we are certainly leading the way in innovation with the introduction of drones and <coughs> the use of reality capture um, technologies um, that make our offering under the site risk survey the the absolute best in the insurance market at this point in time. So one of the other strategic partnerships, and we have Lynn Haywood who's over there, if you just want to put your hand up here. One of the other um, strategic partnerships that we have um, set up in, in order to assist our, uh, our insureds with, their, with keeping their costs low is that we've partnered with Australian AIS International Group um, who are a leader in the provision of uh, referencing and the provision of crim criminal records checks, background screening. Um, and as I said, there is a, a much stronger requirement across all of our sectors now. Um, and we as an insurer uh, know how important it is that uh, staff working with vulnerable adults and children are appropriately screened. Um, so AIS are able to, we have negotiated with them a, I, I know is the lowest rate in the market for uh, those types of checks and they are, um, they can, can also provide very comprehensive uh, reference checking where it's required. So that will be accessible through our website. You simply, you just go up there on the board, you just go to background checks and that will take you through and you'll get the ANSFAR pricing on that, so we encourage you can use it as brokers, we're happy for you to get the benefit of that, um, and also any of your clients, um, 
that we're happy for you to use that. We've used the power of our ability for pricing to get the, get the value there. So just another example of a strategic supplier uh, market. In our ERM support, I mentioned that we provide the strategic risk workshops. This is a comprehensive program across three phases. Um, and uh, once again, we get a lot of um, feedback from our um, clients where we deliver this service. That it really helps them to establish a, a good grounding for their risk management. Um, the boards in particular um, feel that it, it, it gives them a little bit more insight into the, the areas that they have to manage as a, as a risk, those strategic risks, versus the, their, their assurance or oversight role around the operational risk. So we support them through providing, um, in addition, risk register tools and resources. We work with organisations to really understand their risk at a strategic level and at an operational level. And we also uh, follow that through by having sample um, risk registers or we have some formats that they can use. It just helps them put some of those fundamentals in place um, in, in terms of having to meet their requirements under the accreditation and uh, regulatory environment. What I've got here is just an example of uh, this is a tool that we developed for our childcare sector. And this, th when the standards came out, many of them were struggling to understand how to conduct a strategic assessment against their ability to meet the standards. So this particular tool we, we developed and made available to them so that they could uh, use it as a checklist to, to see whether um, there were any particular standards that they were likely to have a weakness in and to be able to put some corrective actions in place prior to accreditation for their rating. Happy for you to pass that on to any of your childcare clients that are ANSFAR clients as well. Um, also, just an example of some of the toolkits here. We've got um, the um, security toolkit for places of worship as an example of where we take a package of information or operational risks that are applicable to um, places of worship and we put it into a pack for that particular client and we have them across the, ra the range of our sectors. I've also brought up there, which we launched last year at this forum, is our business resilience um, tool kit and workbook. You heard um, with the disability sector and the change there in the funding models. Um, traditionally, in, in the space where your one source of funding was from government and you were a welfare model, so you were providing those services on behalf of the government, if something went wrong and you lost your building or, or whatever, it was incumbent on the state government to step in and assist you in um, in how you rehouse those people or how you get your services back on track. That's no longer the case. So these organisations are going to have to have a very, and this is where we think you as brokers are really going to be um, taking this advice to them and getting them to think about it. Previously they never really thought about business resilience and business continuity very much at all because um, they always had that safety net. Um, it's, that also um, applied to their financial um, position. They used to get a block of funding every quarter from the government in advance um, and they were always going to get it. Um, and then they just had to go about in the next three, uh, three months of delivering those services um, as they were instructed to do. Now they won't get paid until they've delivered the services. Um, and that they've got the service um, recipient to sign off to say that they did receive them, then that's got to go through to the agency. And you heard how there was a three or four month delay in getting those processed earlier today. Uh, so if they were to lose their capacity to invoice or they were to lose their, their data in terms of what was outstanding, it, it, it is massive now. This is something they've never had to consider before. So we're saying as brokers, um, there is a really important conversation that you need to have with all your clients in these sectors who tradition have gone traditionally from a government-funded model to a consumer um, model. 
it's not something that they, they have even given a lot to thought to. So that so we've got a tool there that can that can help you do that. So, in in summing all of that up, and you're doing well. I know that we we skipped a break somewhere there in in the course of this morning. Um, that's probably my fault. Sorry. Um, so in summing up. What I'd like to do is say that we've been working for two years now, but particularly in the last 12 months, to develop a suite of supports um, that you can use um, to assist your clients and provide a real solution to some of the enormous challenges that our sectors are facing at the moment. Um, and so what I'm asking you to do is engage us early. Uh, the earlier that you can talk to your client's solutions, um, representative and, and talk about your client and let us help you understand and put together a package of resources and risk management tools that are really going to make a difference to them and, and we really trust that the sooner that you um, involve us in that the sooner that we're the, the more able we are to get those tools out there. Now I might mention uh, the rapid global suite of products um, to assist you in, org in understanding how they work, how they might be helpful. We're happy to provide each of your um, broker organisations um, access to those um, to, um, at any point. So if you're interested in that for your own business, uh, please talk to your client solutions uh, partner um, and we're happy to follow that up. So on that note, I'll actually hand back to Matt to take you through the final part before you get something yummy to eat. Thank you. Right. Okay, thanks everyone. I thought we'd take the, the chance, the final opportunity of the day to talk about um, some of the products that we've got, uh, that we've refreshed recently. Um, and we did hear earlier uh, from Warren um, about uh, our move into property owners. It is something that we have um, used um, our parent company's expertise to um, get involved in that and we have gone to selected partners already and written some business. Um, a lot of our um, organi organisations that we insure already have um, lots of properties in their portfolio so we're looking to extend that. Um, we're also um, leveraging what we already do in the care sector that you've heard about today to get involved with Allied Health. It just makes sense to us to evolve into those sectors. So it's not too dramatic to move into them, but it is something we need to mention and make sure that you understand what we do. So Allied Health, we have designed a uh, business pack. Um, we've kept it quite simple. There's a package there of three sections, property liability and organisational liability. Um, larger organisations can benefit from the standalone policies though, if they are of sufficient size. Our appetite um, is on that screen. I'm not going to read it. It's actually in the, the fact sheets that are on your tables that um, you'll hopefully take with you. Um, please uh, take note of the, uh, the appetite there. We've gone through that with a fine tooth comb. Um, there are some caveats there, of course, that prof professions that require their own PI will be covered by their association. Um, that is pretty standard in the industry. Um, but you'll find um, a comprehensive list there that um, we hope you have some clients that you can refer to us. Um, Property owners, again, there is a business pack um, which uh, uh, we've put together. Um, also, standalone policies for those of a certain size. Um, the key part there, of course, is what your risk appetite is, is, is the next question. Um, we're not looking to build a portfolio of warehousing and manufacturing risks. Um, we, you, you can see from that list that most of those occupations are those which we already insure. There are others, though, that we will look to move into. Um, that you'll see there. Again, that information is in your pack. Um, I think the best thing to do though is if you have um, any inquiries in that regard, come to myself or my team, Mark, Amanda, Jake, Zan, and we will answer that query about whether it's in our risk appetite straight away, and then we'll know what, how to progress from there. Um, I think that's the most important thing to do when we're trying to, to build into something relatively new for us. Okay, so, um, in those two sectors and also in everything that we do, we are very much, it's a call to action that we're looking to develop our scheme area. Um, and we are open business for sustainable schemes. We have a new team uh, recently incorporated under Jim Varalis, who's sitting at the front, um, that specifically looks after schemes. 
both uh, the initiation and ongoing management of those, and we're, we're very keen to, to grow in that area. So if you have portfolio transfers or a new direction you wish to take your brokerage into, then please approach us and we'll look to put something together with you and have those conversations. We're certainly very keen to, to grow in that area and um, we've got quite a lot of experience in putting them together, so we hope that we can work alongside you to uh, make, take advantage of some of the opportunities that we know exist in the sectors that ANSO operates in. Okay, so that brings us to the, the last slide. Um, we will be here afterwards to discuss some of those opportunities. Um, I should say thank you to the whole of the ANSVAR team who are here, and especially to Diana and Eleanor for organising today. Um, of course, to our guest speakers, David, Rowan, Neil and Julie, thank you for your time. I know that uh, uh, many of you can stay and, and, and have a talk afterwards. Um, and also thank you to all of you for attending. Um, your support to us is, is obviously vital to what we do and we really appreciate it. Uh, and we hope that we can start something new from the conversations we've had today as well. Um, you will all be sent a short survey after today. It would be great if you could fill it out and give us your feedback. Um, that allows us to shape the ones that we want to do in the future. Um, and if you feel that any of your colleagues that couldn't make it here today would benefit from the messages that you've heard, please speak to me or my team afterwards and we'll work out a way to have a shortened version of today to, to go and see them and take that message out to them. I think the more people that can hear it, the better. And, and I feel that some of your colleagues um, would benefit from that. Um, that's it from me. Please stay for some lunch. Um, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>